<laughs> hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I've got such a cool guest today uh, with Russ Ballard. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story before we get started. I remember as a kid going to the record shops and I kept looking at the back of the album covers and I kept seeing Russ Ballard's name. And as a, as a, as a kid, I didn't realize, and I, I often, and I wondered to myself, how can this guy be in so many bands? And I didn't realize, you know, the difference between songwriters and writing hit songs and other people recording them. And so, I don't know, three months ago or something, I was like on a rabbit hole in the internet. I saw Russ Ballard and all those memories came flooding back to me. I'm like, holy shit. So, uh, and I never knew what the deal was, but today we're all going to find out what the deal was. I'm honored and a privilege to have Russ Ballard on the show. Uh, I'll give you the cliff notes on Russ. He was the original lead singer and guitarist for the British rock band Argent. He left Argent and went on to have a successful solo career and an incredibly successful career as a songwriter and producer. His songs have literally been covered by hundreds of artists, including well-known hits, and we'll talk about some of them, by Santana, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, Three Dog Night, America. He revived America's career in the 80s, I believe. Night Ranger, Kiss, Roger Daltrey, who Russ also toured with on guitar. King Cobra, Hot Chocolate, Olivia Newton-John, Ace Fraley. The list literally goes on forever here. And he grew up just outside of London in a musical family. He's had an amazing career, which we'll discuss today. Russ, thank you so much for your time, man. It's really a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. See you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into this. You started playing piano first and then guitar, and you were pretty young. Parents got you an acoustic guitar, and once they saw you practicing endlessly and your fingers were finally bleeding, they wound up buying you an electric after you pestered your dad a couple of times. You got a Hofner Club 60 and a True Voice TV 10 watt amp. In reading your bio, it seemed like you felt music very deeply and that you knew from an early age that's what you wanted to do. My question is, is that correct? And is there any chance you still have that guitar or amp? Most of it's correct. I didn't start on piano, actually. I started on drums because my dad was a drummer. Oh, yes. So I, uh, I started on two knit, knit, knitting needles and a uh, biscuit tin, you know, uh, <laughs> as, a kid. as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, I just wanted to do, sort of, I, I watched my dad play drums once and uh, I wanted to do that like you do when you see your dad do something. Uh, then they sent me, they thought it's more important to send me to piano lessons, which they did do. My brother was already going to piano lessons. He was four years older than me and he was pretty good. Uh, and they, you know, they sent me along with him. So that was good. He was yeah. a very good reader. He was a better reader than me, but he wasn't as creative as me, but he was a good, very good reader. Um, so I learned piano for five years. Yeah, then got into guitar. That's all true. Everything else is true. Uh, I don't have the guitar. <laughs> I don't have <laughs> the, the guitar amp. anymore. I don't have the Hofner Club 60 anymore. I don't have the True Voice anymore. I had, I had two True Voices, a, a TV 10. And every time I got... I grew out of guitars or I grew out of uh, a new guitar or a new amplifier uh, and came on the scene. My mum bought me one. She was amazing, you know. She used to that's buy great. Them stuff. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Don't have them anymore. You're, a, you're an incredibly prolific writer, and your first original track was an instrumental. What prompted you to start writing songs, and what do you think, like, about your makeup or your personality do you think has made you such a good songwriter? Uh, it's hard to say because I only know my, my history as, as it's been. You know, I know um, I'm so in love with music, to be honest, from the word go. I just love tunes. And I love lyrics, and I loved, I loved the hit tunes of my time, which were I realised like you. I used to look at the titles, the titles of songs, and underneath the title of it's on the records. Underneath, underneath the title used to be the the songwriters, Lieber sure. and Stoller, and Pomus and Schumann, and Goffin and King. You know this sort, hmm. Buddy Holly, uh, and Fats Domino. Bartholomew, Fats Domino, and this kind of stuff. Um, so I was interested in it, and I thought, 
yeah, I think I could do that. I didn't do it straight away, but I was making up tunes on the piano when I was a kid. I was more interested in making up tunes on the piano than actually doing my practice. You know, making tunes to me was much more interesting to make a melody and stuff, you know, sing ideas to my mum. No lyrics at the time, but uh, yeah, you know, and then I got into a band and um, that's when I wrote the instrumental. So do you think what gifts, I mean, you've got many gifts musically, but what do you think particularly, or not even gifts, but what, what's the driver or the, the, you know, something has to connect all these things in you to create them. What do you think that is? Well, obviously, I, I think my mum my was a dancer. Uh, all her family played, uh, her mum and dad. Um, my grandmother, my grandfather both played piano. In fact, they both played at the same time. You know, one played the bass end of the piano, one would play the tune at the top. Uh, my uncle, her brother, Terry, was a professional trumpet player. Her other brother, Ron, was a musician. He played trumpet and sang and stuff. Um, my dad's side, my dad played piano as well as drums. And he also, uh, his brother played piano. And he was a great stride pianist. You know, he played like, like, um, uh, like ragtime. You play yeah. a lot of ragtime and stride, what they call stride, which I play as well. I play stride piano, and uh, I still love it. I love the sound of it, you know. So, I mean, it's probably genetic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, although I think your history, you know, once you get into things, you know, once you once you get into write, writing tunes, you sort of, or, or once you get into playing, you develop, you get muscle memory, you get better. You are what you repeatedly do, they say, you know. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, tell the story, if you, if you can, Russ, about your first experience where Cliff Richards and the Shadows recorded your song called The Lost City, and your mom gets a, a phone call about that. I was curious, like, did you ever get paid for that? Did you get, like, publishing, writers, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I... You did. Yeah, I mean, it was recorded by The Shadows, um... I wrote it when I was 14. The very first time I'd been into a studio, which was Regent Sound in London, Denmark Street, uh, I think we clubbed together. I wrote this tune. We all wanted to get in. in my band. I had Bob Henry in my band, the drummer, who was in Argent with me, and he was in Unifor mm -hmm. Plus Two with me. Then he went into the Kinks for like 18 years, you know. But uh, we were very, very, very close. We're like brothers. We still are. We went into Argent together. Um, I think we all clubbed together, basically. You know, we put in like a <laughs> probably 20 pounds each to get two hours in the studio and uh, put down. On one side, we had a tune called Travelling Man, which was a hit tune in England by Ricky Nelson. Um, I'm a travelling man, made a lot of stops. Oh yeah, world. I know that song. That was huge. Hit, that even over here, yes, it was, it was so, a huge hit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had his years later. Yeah, this is how life happens. I love Ricky Nils. I, lo I love, I loved his tunes and the stuff and all that, you know. And we used to do a lot of his tunes, as Richie Blackmore did. He did, you know. He was this. All, all the English musicians were listening to the same stuff we were listening to the best of ricky nelson we were listening to uh all kinds of stuff ricky nelson was very popular in england and um uh years later i'm talking about nine <laughs> in the 90s i had his sons over and stay with me for two for two months because i had uh, a, guy Gunner... from Geffen, a guy from geffen records a guy called john colodna at, at oh yeah, I know his name. He's a J O N. He's been a he's a producer, isn't he? He's, he's... no John Colodna. John Colodna was a head of A and R. Okay, I've, okay, I've and, heard his name and, John, and I've read him. Yeah, yeah. read about well, John him. John used to always get in touch with me. He got in touch with me for certain things. He, used to come, he wanted he wanted to sign me at one time, and he wanted me to be in a band and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it didn't happen, but he phoned me one day. He said, "Would you?" He said, do you like Ricky Nelson? He yeah, asked, I said, I love Ricky Nelson. He said, we've signed his, his kids, the Nelson twins. 
Right. They both look like girls, you know, beautiful girls. And uh, he said, would you help to develop their songwriting if I send them over, if I send them over to you? And he sent them over and they stayed there for... Attention musicians, composers, artists, and songwriters. If you have a burning desire to get involved with the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing and take your income to the next level, then you must listen to this. A new free training video has just been released which shows you how to make your first placement in music licensing or if you've already made some placements but you don't have a specific system to make more placements more consistently, you'll learn how to do this as well. This free video training is called Where the Money's Hiding in the Music Business and you can find it online at musicreboot.com. This video shows you how to create the financial stability you've always wanted and how to take advantage of the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing due to streaming and the internet. So check it out online now at musicreboot.com. I think it was two months. And they were great. They were telling me stories about their dad because their dad died in a plane crash, didn't he, years and years, years ago. Yeah. And they said, you know, Russ, you remind us of our dad. You're so much, we were saying, you're so much like Dad, you know. That's so, so funny. Uh, uh, he wrote a great tune, actually. He had a great single that he wrote called um, Garden Party. Yeah, I'll they had, a yeah. Garden Party. Yeah. yeah da, 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 da. That's a great that tune. That's huge. Yeah, so John Kolodna, John Kolodna was head of a and R, and I don't know if you ever saw, looked at the Cher, Cher albums, she used to write his name all over the album. It was Junk Along oh, and Junk Along and Junk She used to scatter it all over. It was meant to be funny, you know. And That's I funny. think that you'll find that uh, Aerosmith did as well. All those people, all those bands that he signed. He wanted me to write for Cher. He sent me a telegram years ago and asked me if I'd write on this one telegram. Would you save two months to write with Cher or write for Cher? Come over and write with her, write with Aerosmith. This and is did you, how, you didn't do it. No, no, I kept the kept the time free, and I phoned him one day. I said, "What's going to happen? Where am I going to be staying, John?" And all this kind of stuff. And he said, "Oh, he, he was complaining about he was complaining about certain things. I won't go into it." And he was saying, "You know, they they want to write themselves, and they I don't know all that kind of stuff." So that was cool. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. I haven't seen him since. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I wrote that thing. I wrote that thing. Um, that was the first Lost time City. we've been into the studio, Lost City, and um, it came about. Wrote it when I was fourteen. We recorded it, obviously, when I was fourteen. Uh, Cliff Richard's brother-in-law used to have a a coffee bar, and in the coffee bar I used to have a pinball a pinball machine and stuff like that. And we used to go down and see him. Because Cliff lived in the same town, the same town as me. And they, he said, what are you doing? What are you up to? He said, oh, we've been into the studio and uh, oh, Russ has Russ is written this instrumental. He said, have you got a recording? I said, yeah, we've got an acetate. You know. He said, well, he said, give it to me. I'll send it to the Shadows Publishing Company, <laughs> which was Carlin Music. And uh, lo and behold, they recorded it four years later. How cool is that? You must have oh, felt like a waiting. million. How did you feel when that, like, you you heard that on the radio, or like just the whole thing happened? Yeah, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because they were the biggest thing before. Yeah, before the Beatles, they were the biggest yeah. thing around, you know. And everyone, every guitar player was trying to be Hank Marvin, and there sure. Hank was. I I used the very first kind of um, on the guitar. I was using a. It wasn't. It wasn't a crybaby wah wah. It was years before cry before the wah wah happened. There was another foot pedal that just turned the signal from bass to treble. It was just. It was called a de Armand tone control, but it okay. still made a wah wah sound, and it sounded really oh, cool. Oh yes, okay. Uh, it was called a de Armand, and. Um, and lo and behold, Hank used one on on his recording. He, used, he did exactly the same as me, which was that great. That is so cool. Did you? Because yeah. I listened to that track. I found it online. It was so cool, and it was funny because it's so like period and specific, you know, for yeah, that yeah, for yeah, that era. Yeah. Um, did you write the guitar solo in there? Was that your? Did he like basically take your whole guitar solo as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wow. about the same. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Played the same Holy tune. Holy yeah. shit! 
That's phenomenal. Yeah. I can't imagine what that's like. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. I okay, so in the mid- too. Yeah, that's that's really cool. In the mid '60s, you're in your early 20s. Your band's growing in popularity. You're doing sessions. You're working in and out of other bands. And Rod Argent, your friend, who's the leader and primary song, who was the leader and primary songwriter for the Zombies, he rings you up and he says, "Hey, do you want to join me in my new band that ultimately became Argent?" Now, something happened there that gave you a, an incredible discipline for writing. So you woke up every day at 7 a.m. and you wrote till 2 p.m., no matter how tired you were, how late you were up, and how, how late you were out gigging the night before. And that was a very fruitful time. You wrote Liar, God Gave Rock and Roll to You, and, and a number of other hits. What prompted you to develop that discipline? Because that's pretty... You know, that's very disciplined. Yeah, I think I think more than anything, it was the love of doing it, the love of doing music. Uh, yeah, with Argent, you know, from the first album, we were touring. So we'd go, we'd drive uh, mainly, mainly in, in the UK. So we'd jump in, uh, jump in the car, drive to Manchester, do a show at the university or a club. And drive home and get home at three or four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'd be awake at seven. I'd be straight on the piano writing tunes at seven. <laughs> so, and, and then the band would show up at two o'clock in the afternoon, and then we would drive to Birmingham, which was a two and a half wow. hour, three hour drive and back. You know, and then we get I get home at two o'clock in the morning, be up at seven, and I did that for two years. I did that like that and weekends. I just I I love writing. I enjoyed. I enjoyed the sort of um, not only the discipline of writing. I enjoyed the whole the whole idea of coming up with the tune, coming up with chords, trying to find a different bass note to the chord and things like that. You know, it was in, everything was interesting for me. I loved it. You know, and I was always pretty disciplined. Actually, I still, I'm still disciplined now. Yeah, it's uh-huh. a natural thing for me. I enjoy only because I love it. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't. I don't think I would work anywhere near as hard. It's not work. Sure, sure. I, I get it. You know, I read a book, a uh, business book years ago. I think it was called Good to Great by a guy named Tom Collins. This is 20 years ago. And he talked about, they did this survey of all these big companies. And the number one thing the most successful companies had in common was discipline. Yeah. And m- I and most of the people I've met, I'm super disciplined as well. And most of the people I've met, uh, that have accomplished a lot also, you know, the, are, are very disciplined. I don't see how you can do a lot without being disciplined personally. They say it's, they say it's the best life. And I found yeah. it, I found it to be the best life. You know, you get up and you just do it every day. And, you know, it's so easy. If you're not disciplined, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to take the day off. I'm going to take right. another day off. I'm not, I'm only going to work for an hour today. Well, I always worked. I'd always work from like that time I was working from seven till around about two in the afternoon because that's the time the band used to pick us up. You can get almost anywhere in the UK for, from two o'clock till two o'clock to <laughs> six or something, you know, get anywhere. So um, sure. it was around, the, I can always remember that time the band would show up. And uh, But obviously you can't, as much as you love it, you can't just keep burning the candle at both ends. Because right. you are going to you are going to suffer in the end, you know, which happened to me, you know. But uh, it does happen. You hear of artists, you hear of bands at cancelling gigs because of uh, they usually call it emotional exhaustion, don't they? Yeah, they, burnout, you know, they've had sure. a bad time, you know. Well, let's, that's a good segue. Let's talk about that. So you did that, and you did that for two years, and you got burned out and your body started literally breaking down and led you into heading into depression. Mm. How did you get out of it? And what was the most important thing you learned from that whole experience? Well, before, before we were in from 1970 to get the band together from late 19, the summer of 1969, Argent uh, went to Germany and we did what the Beatles did and what a lot of bands did. You know, we played in a club. Sure. So instead of going to Hamburg, we went to southern Germany, which was another 600 kilometers away. You know, we went to 
Munich and played in this club called the PN Club on the Leopoldstrasse. And uh, in the PN Club, you played, I mean, it sounds mad, you know, we played for seven 45 minute spots a night. Seven. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Yeah. So Holy you start. Shit. You, would it, would it yeah, be the so, same set, or did you have enough no, tunes no, at the we, time? No, no. We re, we uh, we rehearsed. Uh, we got a bunch of tunes together. We got probably about we all the tunes we could think of. You know, we put together to to, to make it last. Yeah, that's so like what, like it's five hours of music, or six, five and a half hours yeah, of music, or something weekend, like that. We did nine. <laughs> Because we played in the wow. afternoon as well. In at weekends, we played. Uh, you know, we start at two o'clock in the afternoon. We do uh, two forty-five minutes. Let's go back to the. We called it the Doom Pad in this this apartment, and then we go back at seven and start again. You know, and do a seven. That must have been such great training, like guitar. Tr I mean, musically to be playing that much. I got to believe. That's it really... how the Beatles got so good. Yeah. That's how they became so good because they were trying everything. They were trying every kind of tune. That's what we did, you know. Rod yeah. was singing. I mean, we even like we like the Goff, uh, Carol King song. We liked um, uh, "You Made Me Feel Like a Natural Woman." Rod sure. said, "I'll sing that. I'll sing that." And he'd say, <laughs> "I made you feel." How made you feel like a bachelor? <laughs> it sounds a little bit arrogant, Rod. They said, don't matter. It lasts, it lasts for four minutes or five minutes. But we've put in solos. We've put in long solos. We do all this sure. kind of stuff to make it, you know, to make it. I asked Paul McCartney, in going back to 1963, which I was chatting to all the Beatles. We were in the same hotel. And we were sitting together. And I said, I said when you went to Hamburg, how did you, how did you get through those? How'd you get through those uh, days? And he said, "We just make the make the endings long, make the solos long, make everything you know, make it make it all longer." You know, so uh, that's how you get through. But we we found it very difficult because you know, well, after doing after singing like you're trying to get all these songs together, you find your voice starts to fail. I went to I said to this guy yeah. Ziggy, I said to Ziggy in the club, I said, "How do bands get through this?" He said, you go to the apotheque, you buy the anine pills. You take the anine <laughs> pills with the beer. <laughs> What's anine? What is anine? Anine, A-N-1. A-N-1 pills. You know, you take them with beer. What is that? You know, it's brilliant. I mean, it's pure speed. Oh, speed. Okay. Okay. It's That's, speed. Yeah, they right, sold right. it over the counter in Germany. <laughs> and it was basically... It was hilarious. used by. It was used, and I'm talking about 1970 here. It was used by 69. Um, it was used by long distance lorry drivers. It oh, was used okay. Also, yeah, basically that was the idea for long distance lorry drivers want to stay awake or kids studying in the university and stuff. That was the idea, but then they took it. <laughs> they took it off the market a few, a couple of years later. That's that's wild. Take take yeah. anion pills. Um, what did you get out of that experience where you were burned out and you came? Like, how did you recover from that? And like, what did what did you get? Like, what was the quote lesson? I guess, or what was what did you learn most out of that? Mainly for people that ever go through depression or whatever, you do get through it. Now I've learned if it happens again. It did happen again. It happened when my dad died, but uh, but it wasn't so bad when my dad. You know, everyone everyone's upset when somebody you care about, somebody you love, dies. So, I um, I was very close to my mum and dad. So, you know, that hit me. Uh, I learned that sometimes you need medication. If you don't, if I, if I hadn't have taken medication. I didn't know what had hit me, Craig, because it was something that uh, just happened. And yeah. I'd always done what I did, you know. And then I was twenty. I was twenty. Twenty six. Uh, I was twenty. I was twenty six when it happened. Yeah. It's when I should have been having the best time of my life because we had a hit record in America with "Hold Your Hair" that was number four. Yeah. We went to the states to start a tour for seven seven weeks, and the. A couple of days before, I just crashed, and the doctor said it's best 
if you actually go rather than cancel the tour? He said, because what you're going to do, you know, if if you've got your friends there to support you, you've got Rod, Jim and Bob, they're going to support yeah. you and your, your team, they're going to support you. Never cancel a show. That's amazing. Stayed on the road, stayed on the road and did it. Um, and I felt better when I was on the stage and when I came off the stage, you know, I thought it was like, a, it was like, a, it was like a long panic attack. It was like a permanent, almost a permanent panic attack. And How I'd long never did it had take you to come like out? That. I'd never had a panic attack before, so to me it was all new, you know. But you go yeah. to the doctor and they give you pills, they give you Valium and they give you Norbrium and they gave you Stelazine and sleeping pills, pills to get you to sleep, pills to sure. wake you up. Um, so, yeah, I was on pills for nine months. Okay, so it took you nine months to come out of that. It took nine months to sort of come out of it. and um, But, you know, once you've had that kind of thing, it's uh, – I'm not sorry I went through it because I was a different person coming out than the person going in. In what way? Uh you know, people would say, I'm sure had I have been – a lay person, I would have said, I would have said something like, uh, God has spoken to me or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Or mm. that, you know, you hear people say, uh, which they do say, you know, when they have that kind of experience, it's almost, if I was religious, I would have said it because it was so different from anything. Sky was bluer. <laughs> you know, everything was more intense. And it never really left me. It was always like that. And it's so still you just like saw that. things deeper. Deeper, you everything was deeper. Things, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is deeper. Interesting. And it was like it was almost like growing up. It was a strange thing. It was like going from a, a boy into a man, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. you sang lead vocals and played guitar on Hold Your Head High. Yeah. Which is to me now even still today when i hear that track it's one of those things like shush you know like this is like hollowed ground we need to freaking hear this thing you know yeah. um but after you recorded that track did you know did you have any kind of sense that like holy shit i think we got something here people liked it i mean the road managers used to come and we did it at abbey road uh, like we did all our albums, but most of them at Abbey Road, and uh, the roadies were coming in, and they said, "Ah, oh, this is my favourite. Oh, I love this tune. Oh, and all that kind of stuff, you know." So we thought, and obviously they thought it at CBS as well. So they released that one. Yeah. yeah so that, we did have that feedback, but we got that idea from Germany when we were in Germany. You know, we were, as I said before, with the Leopoldstrasse playing in the PN club one of the tunes we used to do was a rod tune we used to do time of the season okay another go, amazing do, do, track do, 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 do. it's the time of the season and uh, we used to play that song rod used to sing it but we used to, to make the to make the tune last we used to get into it do, 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 and you play this long keyboard solo and then it go into and I go oh, so hold your head high it, came out of that it came out of that then we go oh. and you used to get to some magic moments you know we yeah. play this stuff and sometimes it was a chemical thing I would play stuff and I got into the middle where I scraped the guitar strings in the middle of it. In the middle of I used to do that live as well, you know. And everybody used to sort of look up and think, what, what is going on there, you know. So we used that on the track. That was a very hooky part of the tune. I was just sliding my ring on my finger down the, down the fretboard, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, little things like that, you know. I think that was a hook. Um, yeah, that's how that came about. Chris Chris White said it would be great to write a song around it. Chris White was in the Zombies, bass player in the Zombies. Yes. 
He said, it'd be great to write a song around that, you know. And he goes away with Rod and he comes back, they come back with this song that Chris had on a, he'd, he'd done it on acoustic guitar and he was singing it to me. And he said, this is what we've come up with. And it was Hold Your Head Up. Such a great, it's such a great track. It's kind of a, I have to be honest with you. I'm not a guy that gets starstruck, but it's kind of a pinch me moment talking to you about this track because it was such a meaningful track to me as a as a kid it's a great like lyric i said as well you know i mean it's a very, it's an intelligent lyric as well which chris yeah. chris was a very intelligent writer you know i've said to him before it was a great great writer great writer he wrote some good stuff in the zombies you know mm. in the on the first album he wrote um dance in the smoke which was a great idea for a song, you know, we will build a giant burning fire tonight. We will build it and dance in the smoke. Everybody's, every branch will tie somebody's worry to it. We will build it and dance in the, we will burn it and dance in the smoke. Great idea for a song. Yeah. So, so, so of the time, it was brilliant. It was so, uh, Definitely. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Argent, super popular. At a certain point in time, though, you said you don't like the direction the band was moving in, especially in concert. They're getting into more improv, jazzy stuff, so you decide to leave. I give you a lot of credit for that because that's not an easy thing to do at all, especially with a, with a band that's on the rise. What was behind your decision, Russ, and what gave you the courage to sort of know that, you know, everything's going to be okay? Because I got that when I read the story that you had yeah. that feeling. Uh, more than anything, um, it took a, you know, when we made the first album, we were tougher alive, much tougher than we we sounded on record at the time. We were much tougher, but uh, which wasn't too much of a problem. But um, when we when we played live, Rod was stretching out, doing a lot of improvisation, you know, a lot of improvisation, you know. Um, and I think once you lose, it's all very well doing improvisation. I mean, the keyboard players love it that are in the audience, but I used to look at some of the crowd and they'd be sort of, you see their mind wandering, you know, while you're doing a three minute keyboard solo. And, uh, and with, a, with a band that's to, doing songs like Hold Your Head High, yeah. Yeah, I could totally yeah, because see it'd that. be all yeah. improvisation and stuff, you know, uh, at least with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, if you remember Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Of course, they, yeah, I love them. Always, yeah. Keith Emerson always Carnival played Night, tunes. everything. Always play but that tunes. was their whole. But that was their whole thing, though. That was their vibe. That was their thing. Was, yeah, but they they, yeah. Very, they didn't they didn't improvise that much. It was tunes. They were playing tunes all the time. Da, 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 da. That's nice. They're playing that. Uh, which you know, when people can hear a tune, but when it's improvisation, this uh, only Rod could hear it. I couldn't hear it from my side of the stage. I couldn't hear it. Uh, so okay. I wanted to do more tunes, and I. That's the reason, really the main reason I left, to be honest. Uh, and it was going and it was getting more and more proggy, which I wanted to get more. I would prefer to go more rocky. Yeah. Myself, that's how I was, you know, I was writing those kind of tunes. Was it, was it a, uh, how did you know, like, how did you have the confidence to leave, basically? I don't know. I just did it because I knew I had to do it. Uh, yeah. I, I wanted to do it. Um, I was right. I had Liar. Liar had been out. And it was okay. here. Give me. And I had publishing money. So I had enough money in a year from Liar, basically, and, and being hold, – Hold Your Head Up was out as well. I had the B-side of Hold Your Head Up. I had enough money coming in, to, and it looked – I bought a house. I put, you know, uh, I bought a house. Uh, I put enough money down to buy a nice house, and then um, I still had money. And money was coming in. Three Dog Night did another one of my songs on the next album. Okay. So the publisher, the publisher was well happy. I was going back to the publisher and saying, you know, and they said, if you need any more money, oh, we give. They wanted to keep me. Pub they wanted to keep keep me as a songwriter because I was doing sure. well, you know. So they were offering me money. I I thought. I could, I could do this. So, okay. But I think instinctively, I was working every day anyway. I was working every day. I thought if I keep – people were saying, I love your tunes. Play me that tune you sang to me the other day. Play me that tune you play me on the piano. And I was playing all this stuff, 
And they were all, all different kind of tunes. Some of them were like show tunes I was playing. So interested in just finding new things about myself, you know, what I could write. I was doing things like, you know, you should see this girl, you know she's straight from hell. She's Hollywood potential, and to be a star you must know it's essential that you meet her. You will find a chick that's need her. She's just 16, and I think she's your scene. I bet you will surrender when you see your black suspender. <laughs> it's the future. Mr. Oh, Mr. Mr. Won't you help my sister? Well, doing all this kind of... <laughs> Doing all sorts of things. I turned that so you're all over the place. Yeah. yeah, it's all over the place. But I had time to do it, you know, because I had plenty of time. I was working from like uh, when I was off the road. I was working from eight in the morning till well, till two in the afternoon. So I would, I would try try all sorts of things. Okay, so basically, you had you you financially you were okay and you said okay now i can take a gamble because i know i have xyz money coming in i got a place now and it's it's all good and another thing you think actually craig another thing you think if it if it all goes the other way then i've got a decent house i could always i could always uh, sell the house right right and, and get a cheaper house and have some money in the bank and stuff like that you know i think i i think that's sure. all in the brain but I had a wife and I had a child. I had Christian. Christian was born sure. in, and uh, uh, it was it was that was magic. I wanted to go back on the road. I wanted to get a band together. I was making albums. I was still signed to CBS. I was making albums, and people were cutting the songs, so that was good. Um, besides the number of opportunities that existed. What are the biggest differences between the environment for creating music between, let's say, even from the 60s to the 90s? I don't even want to go into, you know, to today because it's radically different. But any, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as, as a guy It's very been in the different. In the, go back to the 60s and 70s, there were, there were record companies. There were record companies. There was no internet. There were record companies signing bands. And if you made it, it was the you know it was it was a pot of gold basically for the band and for the writers as well. We've got publishing as well, so it was very it was seemed very very simple that you know you were signed to a three with CBS you were signed to a, a three album deal. And to be fair, CBS stuck with you, stuck with you for three albums. You know, and basically you went on the road, you built up a following. You released the second album, went on the road, you bought more of a following, you released the third album, and hopefully one of those albums would, uh, you would have a hit single, which we did with Hold Your Head Up. Uh, so it was very, very simple, and you sold loads of, <laughs> loads of records. It was so simple, you know, you had a band, you signed, and you put the record out, and you toured. Now it's nothing like that. There's a million bands all online together, and uh, yeah. you have to be very special. You don't have the money to make videos like record companies used to make videos as well. Yeah. So you were seen, and you get the video out there, and you get on television. But it's very different. It's the scene is so different now. Uh, and as you get older, it's even more different. You know, obviously, yeah. it's very, it's very, very different. But. Uh, it's all great when you're playing music. It's all good. For I want to talk about some of your, your songs. For each one of them, Russ, if you could tell me the backstory of the song itself. And also, I'm curious how you were first approached by the artist who recorded it or how the track got to them, as well as any cool or interesting stories about uh, working with them. So, and these, it's just amazing that you wrote all these songs, to be honest with you, man. Uh, winning from your album of the same name, Santana did that. How did, yeah, how, you know, yeah. backstory to the track, how did you guys hook up and all that stuff? I've never met him. I've never met <laughs> You're Carlos. You're kidding. Never met him. No, I've never, That's I've never amazing. met him. He's done two of my songs. He did, um, I had another single with him, which was uh, Nowhere to Run. Which was which worked out really well. It was it was it wasn't as commercial as winning, but I wrote winning for myself. It was a story of my life. 
It was talking about, you know, my history, my history of, the, of being low and then being high. You know, one day I was on the ground when I needed a hand, couldn't be found. I was so far down that I couldn't get up. One day I was one of life's losers, even my friends were my accusers. In my head, lost before I begun. Had a dream, but it turned to lust. Is it that's what I thought was love? Must have been must. I was living in style when the walls fell in. And when I played my hand, looked like the joke could turn around. Fate must have woke because Lady Luck, she was waiting outside my door. I'm winning. I'm winning. <laughs> the whole, each verse. It's such a good verse, track. Each verse. Keith Urban's just done a version of it. It's really, really good. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> It's really good. He's done. He's done the best version of it, actually. I think. Really, he's done a fantastic I'll version. It's very, it out. it's very country, but he's done a real, really good, great guitar, and he sounds more American than uh, than Louis Armstrong. Does he sound American? I think he probably does. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, how, uh, so how did that? How did Santana get a hold of that song? Did, how does well, that I work? Do they I, approach yeah. you, or do they approach yeah, your company? It, no, no. Basically, I did an album in the States in 1977. I'm just trying to think. No, that album, I recorded the album in 75. I recorded the album in 75. I remember uh, in 77, I made an, I made an album in America uh, that Keith Olsen produced. He loved that. He said, I love that song winning on your album. I love that song winning. Then Santana did it, but I'm sure Santana did it before. I always thought Keith Keith played it played it to Carlos because he he produced a Santana album. Okay, so I've got so a that's feeling how, that. So that's how uh, you think it got? Yeah, I think so. I never found out how Carlos did it. Actually, I never found out, but um, I know that Keith produced their album, and he loved winning. So I assumed it was Keith. It was it, it was recorded before before Carlos actually a guy called Michael Quattro did a version of Susie no. Quattro's brother. I was going to say is that Susie? I was that's the only Quattro I've ever heard. Susie Quattro. Yeah, yeah. yeah Susie Quattro's brother uh, recorded it first of all, and that that must have been seventy seventy six seventy five seventy six. But I did that on my album. My album was called Winning. That was my first yes. single. That was yeah. my first single from my album. Which didn't happen. My second single from the album was "Since You've Been Gone." Yeah, let's go. Let's talk about that one next. So, I, I mean, that's like one of Rainbow's greatest songs. That era, yeah, of Rainbow, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, it's just how. So, tell me the backstory to that track, and then well, I how recorded it. I recorded Blackmore it. got Muff, his hands on it. Yeah, Muff Winwood produced it produced my version and I played it to him on piano. You see, I played ga 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 played it on piano. So we did it on piano, which was much made it much, much softer. Yeah, so very you different. Do, you do a thing and and uh, a, a moog I, I played moog on it as well, which is added. So it's very, very tender in the in the verse. It's very, very tender and very pretty. <laughs> Instead of this real if I'd have thought about it, I would have done it with with overdriven guitar, you know, if I'd have thought about it at the time instead of Anyway, uh, the first band to record it after were a band called Head East. Yeah, sure. They recorded it before Rainbow. Uh, and then Rainbow recorded it. And then um, a band called, a girl band called um, they were Clout, South African band, did a version like mine. God, your Very memory good. is phenomenal, man. Yeah. And then. Sherry and Mary Curry did it right. years later. They all got in the charts. They all got in the American charts. That if, I think it was in there four times altogether with four different four different artists. Um, How did Blackmore get a hold of it? He heard he 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 had <laughs> Rainbow went on the road having Head East support them. Okay. They oh, the and they played. Yeah, it. they heard the song. That they heard the song, and. Richie, Richie said that that's, that's how they heard the song. <laughs> From their opening act. And then they said, Let me, we're going to do that better. Oh, yeah, we could do this. We could do this, yeah. And, and they had the much bigger that's, hit with it. But, uh, yeah. That's crazy. Then Head East, Head East did uh, the next one. They did I Surrender as well. 
Yes, did they? I didn't know that. That's yeah, that's, they did. Us so they did two. Yeah. And then Rainbow did the same thing. <laughs> Blackboard did the same. Did that. And had a bigger hit. Rainbow had a bigger hit with that. Yeah. Yes, yes, for sure. Okay, I want to talk about New York Groove. I didn't even know that that was Ace Fraley until like literally about a year or two ago. I, I heard, I know the song. Yeah, I didn't even know it was Ace Fraley. Uh, and that I read your story that came about when you were on a trip to the city one day and you said, oh, it's some, this is a New York Groove or something like that. He said, I can, that sounds like a good title. Well, no, I, uh, in 75, when I left Arjun, uh, I played on Roger's, Roger Daltrey's first solo album. I mm. played guitar at his house. For the second, for the second one, he said, "Russ, can you will you produce my next my next album? Can you write some songs and produce produce my next album?" So I did that and recorded at the Who, Who Studio at Bramport in Battersea. Uh, I wrote three songs, played them to him. He said, "Oh, great, great, great." Um, I wanted to go on the road, really. I wanted to get my my own band together, go on the road, which I did do in '76, but. Uh, you know, Roger said, um, have you got any songs? I played him the songs. He said, yeah, that would be great to do. That I've got this song I'd like to do. I've got this song I'd like to do. I said, right, that's five. He went, yeah. I said, right, uh, do you want me to write some more? He said, well, I'm <laughs> going to go on. Yeah, I'm going to go on holiday for six weeks. He said, I'm going to the Caribbean for six weeks. I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, put anything down, put anything down, put anything you think would, would be okay. He said, I'd like to do Walking the Dog as well, do a different version of Walking the Dog. So I said, I do now. And uh, and uh, I said, but I won't know what, I won't not, I won't know what um, key you're going to sing in. He went, I can sing in any key. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that guy is so, he's one of the best, his voice. Yeah, he's, yeah. So, I mean, so, just classic yeah. voices. Yeah, he became a very good friend. So, uh, yeah, that was that 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 was cool. Um, so you, how did you? So then, when did you go to New York? That gave you this whole yeah, idea. Yeah, I went to I went to master his album. Oh, okay. Everybody, I I tried it. I tried it at the master room in London, and everyone was saying to me, "You get a louder, you get a louder cut if you go to New York." I go to Sterling Sound. Sterling Sound, yeah, that was a big yeah, place. Yeah, Sterling back in the Sound, day. Bob Ludwig at Sterling mm. Sound. So I arranged mm -hmm. to go over there. I flew over there on my own. I got on the plane and I hadn't been to New York for oh, about 18 months. So I was quite pleased to go out there, you know, and just chill, basically. Um, on the As I got on the plane, I thought back in the New York groove, I don't know why I was always thinking of titles i like titles you know I thought, that's a great title for a song new york group i thought of uh bo diddly you know that kind of idea and i was thinking of lyrics going over there i was just thinking you know and it was all very vague all the lyrics i didn't write the lyrics down i only wrote the title down then my brother my brother, who was, you know, he was doing functions. He was playing this club in Enfield, and they came. And he said, "This, I watched this band playing with us last night." He said they were sixteen years old. These kids, and he said, "You ought to sign them. You ought to go and write some songs for them." He said because they'd be brilliant, you know. And this was the time when we were doing, we were going around um, doing TVs for Hold Your Head Up. But anyway, I went to see the band. I spoke to, he got to know them. He gave me their address. I went to see their mum and dad. And um, they set up in their, in their living room and they played me these status quo tunes. They were playing status quo. And they did really well. The singer looked like a million dollars. You know, he looked amazing. They're all kids, small kids. And uh, I took them into the studio. And I thought, what can I do with them? I do, I do New York Groove. Made it up in the studio. Made so you the wrote the song up. in the studio? Wrote the song in the studio. And they would tell you. I uh, wrote the song in the studio. And I knew I had a super vampire harp. 
So it sounded like uh, a bow diddly thing. Ah, kind of idea. Been a year since I was here on the street. I'm just just made up. You know, I'm just thinking about being in New York and thinking of a fictitious story. I even got the. I even. I know. I, I I got the streets wrong and all that kind of stuff. People have told me that, but it just sounded right. You know. Yeah. Stop yeah. The third and forty three. Exit through the night. It's going to be ecstasy. This day was made for me. Here, first rap. Great. Here I am again in the city. With a fistful of dollars. And baby, you better believe I'm back. Back in the New York crew. You know, that was the idea of the cheer. But it worked, you know. Got him a deal with Arista. And it was a hit in England. This is for a band called Hello. I, I've heard of them. I, I'm yeah, almost yeah, positive about that. And I had about four, four or five hits with them in Germany. They were huge in Germany. And so they were, I don't, the next one, it was glam rock time, the time of the glam rock thing, you know. And my next one was called Star Studded Sham, Gold Plated Cheap, Diamond Studded Fake, you know, it was all that <laughs> kind of stuff. You know? it yeah, was yeah, fun, sure. You know, it was fun. Then Let It Rock, a song called Let It Rock. Uh, this is 1975, 76, 77. And uh, and then Ace Freely did it in '78. He did it three years later. How did that? How did he get a hold of that? I don't or, know. If you know, yeah, I don't know. I know who was the guy that produced him at the time. He was the engineer, wasn't he? Did Hendrix as well? He oh, did Hendrix. Um, I spoke to him. Eddie, uh, Eddie, Eddie Kramer. Yeah, Eddie. Eddie. Yeah. Eddie Kramer. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie, I spoke to him on the phone. Yeah, he produced that, and he he, he got a great sound on that. Um, yeah, big hit. And then Kiss used to do it as well, but on occasions. <laughs> um, so these, so you don't even necessarily like these are like little sort of assets almost floating around out there. And then someone says, "Hey, I want to like use this asset," and it, and it's like unbeknownst to you even at the time necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, things, um, the great thing is, you know, they used to talk, my manager said to me when he knew I wrote, he said, you're in the right business, you know, doing what you're doing. I said, what? He said, right in tunes. He said, it's the real estate of the music industry. Hmm. And it still is, even though there's yes. not the same amount of money in it now, because, you know, songwriters get a rough deal now. They used to get a yes. really good deal. Now, there's still, you know, it's still a good, it's a great thing to do anyway, to write yes. tunes. It's a great thing to do. To be out there playing is a great thing to do. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's not the same as it used to be financially, but I still do well. I still do well. Yeah. And, um, you know, tunes are still played in elevators. They're still played in, in shopping malls. Movies. Movies. TV. Movies, yeah. yes, you know. Yeah. Talk about Liar, because that was a massive hit by, uh, with Three Dog Night. Well, I wrote that. It was a quick one as well. You know, that was a very quick tune. I was still writing that going to the studio. I, was, I went with the road manager, and I knew we'd put down the track, Liar. We'd put down the track, and I said, look, if tomorrow I'll come back with the lyrics. And I came back the next day. We, we recorded that at um, Sound Techniques in Chelsea. And um, I was sitting with the road manager who was driving you know, in, in the truck. And I was write, writing, you know, writing this, writing the lyrics. And uh, I, I was thinking of it as a blues, you know, a blues tune, you know. I won't ever leave while you want me to stay. Nothing you could do that could turn me away. Hanging on anyway, believing the things you say, being a fool. You've taken my life, so take my soul. That's what you said. I believed in, ain't that what you said? Ain't that what you said? Ain't that what you said? Liar! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, the whole idea, the thing that thrilled me about it was that it was the element of surprise, which to me right. is is so much an important thing in life, if, in art, the element of surprise. Hitchcock had it with movies. You put something that's, I even put that in the shadows too, and I put the surprise going double time in the, in the middle section. 
because it was a beautiful flowing tune it gets into the middle of the section it goes into double time and i thought even then i thought it's a nice kind of thing to have Elements yeah it is surprise. definitely even in a joke you say something you end up with a surprise you know <laughs> totally yeah 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 so how, do you know how like uh the th chuck negron or three dog night any of those guys how they came across the tune or no i don't know i don't know but they did another one of mine on their next album didn't they they did uh, uh chained on the next album yeah from that was on from the second hour uh, that was on our second album they took chain from the second album for my our that seems album. pretty common like if someone does one of your tracks they have a hit it's like going back to the well like well let's try another one yeah but that was never written that was definitely that was definitely uh, an another blues kind of tune i guess they were trying it again but it wasn't as it was a good tune but it was very kind of down you know it was kind of I was treating that, it was called Chain, but I was treating it as like a gospel tune, you know? Mm. And it had like... Is there any... Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, you go. But it had, it, the, it had a, nice, a, a, a nice lyrical idea, you know? It said, free as a bird when it flies, free like an old man that dies, just like a stream or a rose growing wild. Somewhere there's someone walking the road, someone who carries a load. Don't be too far to see. Somewhere there's a man who's chain, chain, chain. God, why did so you let the him go? So same surprise. Same sort, kind of surprise. That was the idea, you know. Is there any other, are there any songs that were recorded by someone else that have some sort of meaningful or sentimental value to you? I mean, I'm sure there's dozens, but there's oh, one yeah, two coming yeah, to mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Songs always do, you know, people talk about the songs as being their babies. Well, I don't know about that so much, but, uh, you know, it's a part of your life that you spend. The quick ones are always the best ones, to be honest. They are always the ones that seem to click. When you spend two or three days trying to, th trying to think of another verse to a song, they never seem to happen. It's always the quick ones. They just seem to happen in a burst of energy, you know. Um, I wrote a song years ago called, it was a hit in England. It didn't happen in America. It was a hit in England. It was by a guy, Connie Blundstone, that sang lead for Zombies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it was a song I wrote called I Don't Believe in Miracles, which was, again, was a very negative kind of title. Very negative, and people say, "Oh God, this is a beautiful song. You've got to change it to I do believe in miracles." And I said, because I, I I was down at the time, you know. I said, "No, it's got to be I I don't believe in miracles. That's the thing. That's the key to it, you know. That's the key that it's I don't believe in miracles. But I thought you might show your face or have the grace to tell me where you are." Basically, it was like a, again that was like a spiritual song, you know. I walk along the road and pass your door. And I remember things you said. I know in time it could have been so much more, but if you want to come back home, go right ahead. But I don't believe in miracles. I don't believe in miracles. But I thought you might show your face or have the grace to tell me where you are. And I believe I was your game, your ball. If you threw me up, then I would fall. And so you've won again. You win them all. I believe I'd run to you if you should call. But I don't believe in miracles. But I thought you might show your face or have the grace. Wow. But I believe that it's somewhere... Heavy, I believe that somewhere there's someone who's going to light the way when things go wrong. The bullet that shot me down was from your gun. The words that turned me around were from your song. But I don't believe in miracles. I don't believe in miracles. But I thought you might show your face or have the grace to tell me where you are. Do -de do 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 do. <laughs> it was argent. We played on it and Colin sang it. When we did the backing vocals, Rod and I did, and Jim did the backing vocals. Sound like the zombies, actually. Was that a uh, something from a personal experience? Because that was yeah, pretty heavy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I cried when that, I put my head on the keys and cried like a baby. But it was a breakup. You had a breakup. Oh, no, no, it's much, much worse. My friend who had the studio, he had a demo. His father had a demo studio, so I used to do my demos there. But it was my friend. And a uh, very highly intelligent guy. He went to Manchester University to study computers. 
in 1964. And while he was in this in Manchester, he met a girl called Carol, who was around about the same age. She, I think she's a bit older. Uh, they fell in love and all that kind of stuff, whatever love is. <laughs> and <laughs> he came back. He came back from uh, Manchester University. They married, very very close. They're great friends of mine, you know. And um, then I was involved with my lady who was to be my wife, mm -hmm. and uh, we were friends. And um, Janet, my wife, and I went on holiday, and I spoke. I all the way I go, went to Spain on holiday and on the plane I said to Jam, I should have phoned Nick. You know, Carol's not well. He said, Carol isn't well. And I know, you know, he was he didn't know really what was wrong. He thought it could be cancer. So all the time I was thinking the first thing I've got to do when I get back to England is phone Nick to see how Carol is, you know. Um it was just amazing. When I got back from the holiday, I phoned the studio. First thing I did, put the cases down, phoned the studio to see it. I said, uh, there was an American engineer there, Rich, Richie Gold. His name was Richie Gold. And I said, Richie, is Nick there? He said, Russ, haven't you heard? No. Carol died. Oh, She's, wow. um, It's a funeral today. Is it the funeral? Oh my God! Yeah, and I went upstairs. Not not the same day. The next day, I went upstairs and I wrote that tune. And uh, it was Richie that said to me, "You've got to change the lyric to I do believe in miracles." He said, "No, no, no, no." But it touched such a nerve. When I play it in England, everyone goes mad when I play it because it was a big hit. It it was a it was everyone loves it. It touched a nerve in England and Tony Black made it his record of the week on Radio One. It was a hit. It wasn't a big hit because I think because it was a negative title. But everyone loves that tune. You know when I do yeah. it, everybody they all go mad and they say, Well are, we, are you gonna do I don't believe in miracles? Are you gonna do I uh but the chords are beautiful. I mean, they sound they sound really sweet in the, but they've got great bass notes on there. The bass note shouldn't be there, you know. And it sounds makes the song sound uh, different, you know. Wow, that was heavy. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go listen to that. Uh, are you still? Is your buddy still alive? Are you guys still friends? Or Nick died? No, Nick. Nick lost a lot of. Um, he was when she died. He was twenty. He was twenty. 27 or 28 when she died she was 28 29 when That's she died terrible. and uh nick died he died oh he died 23 years ago he died 48 oh yeah 48 sorry. when he died That's terrible yeah. yeah wow sorry about that that's tough no no it's one of those things craig it happens doesn't it? you know my brother was 51 when he died you know, as you oh, get wow. older, you find your you find your your very good friends. <laughs> so it's one of those crazy things, you know. But that's that's how it is. That's the life, you know. That is yeah. life, and that is that's your journey. You know, you're going to make the journey great. You get up Absolutely. every day and enjoy it. You can't waste journey. You can't waste this journey. It's, when you make music, you don't waste it. You know, every day you're playing the piano, playing the guitar in the studio, writing songs. The world makes sense. It doesn't make sense if you go into it. Most people do a job they don't want to do. Yeah. To pay the mortgage, to pay the bills. So they settle for a job and they go, oh, God, I've got this job. I don't. And they do it all their lives, not following a passion. Passion is the key. And it makes the world make sense. A hundred percent. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. This is Denny. This is Denny Craig here. Denny's Denny's just she's just want me a glass of water. Thanks, Denny. Oh, no gin and tonic. <laughs> How did you know? Gin and tonic. <laughs> just want me a gin and tonic. It's great. No. I I recognize it. Uh, when you know, Ann goes lemon, over there, the lemon and the when, ice. This is very English. When Ann, yes, that's why I noticed because my wife What's drinks your wife's it. Name? What's your wife Anne, called? A -N, a N N E. Anne. I bet Anne has a gin and tonic. Absolutely. And when she goes over, her mom and her sister get her this gin that they only sell over there. Uh, I don't know what. I don't. Off the top of my head, I can't think of it. But it's a big. It, yeah, it, gin is a big thing in this country. It's yeah, crazy. it really is. Yeah. 
water. <laughs> hey, I, said I, to her, born... I said to her, I said to her, in an hour's time, then, can you bring me gin and tonic? <laughs> I knew that wasn't what. Hey, Russ, I was born at night, but not last night. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty uh, cool. That actually the sus that happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough, tough question. Uh, just give me your knee jerk reaction. Top three musical experiences you've had. Uh, top three musical experiences. I wrote something down here. Actually, I wrote something. Oh, good. Oh, I've got it here. Actually, I wrote down. I wrote down something for this here. Cool. Oh God, I've had so many. I tell I you, I tell you, no Tough one's course. had the. I tell you, I don't care who that. No one's had the life that I've had. No That's one's beautiful, had man. the life that I've had. It's just, and it's music. I yeah. loved football when I was. I was good at football, and then I had the accident, and uh, so the football was out the window. Everyone said, "Yo, you're going to be a professional footballer." But I had an accident when I was twelve, and that was out the window. Then music. What a gift. The only two things I've ever done, only two things I'm really good at. Um, top three. When I used to look, get these, I used to get records when I was young. I used to look at the song title and the, and the names of the songwriters. So I sussed it same as you. Who's Lieber and Stoller? Oh, they write for Elvis. Homus and Schumann. Oh, they write for Elvis. They write for, you know. Ray Charles, they write for the Drifters. Pomus and Schumann, I idolize these people in a way. I never met them, didn't even know what they look like. But I said, you know, Pomus and Schumann wrote a lot of hit songs. Do you know their songs? Do you know Dr. Pope? No, I don't. I know Lieber and Stahler's songs. I don't know Pomus and Schumann. Yeah, well, they were the same, in the same, basically the same publisher, the same, um, I think they were in the Brill building as well. Yeah. Probably all those guys uh, were Neil Sadaka, Carol King, and all those people. But um, uh, they were, you might be too young to remember Teenager in Love. Yeah, I do remember that. It was, it was before my time, but I know the song. Teenager in Each time we have a quarrel, it almost breaks my heart. Because I am so afraid that we must have to part. Each night I ask the stars up above. Boom, 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 boom. Why must I be a teenager in Pobus and Schumann? Okay. I get a call from, from uh, I know Mort Schumann moved to England in the mid-60s. He loved the idea, loved England, and he moved to the 60s. I never met him, but he wrote a song for the Small Faces. It was a hit, got to number one while he was in England called Sha La 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 Lee. Uh, he phoned me and said, Russ, I'd love to write with you. Well, who is it? It's Mark Schumann. Uh, oh, fantastic. I followed your career for years, you know, kind of thing. You and must have shit yourself when he, you get that call. Yeah, he said, yeah. <laughs> he said, he said, Russ, I, I'm a big star in France. Oh, my God. I'm a big star in that. France. You know, and he <laughs> said, uh, I want you to write for my album. Write with me for my album, you know, sort of thing. So um, they turned up at the house. I didn't know then he had been a big drinker. And uh, he had liver problems and stuff. He was only like 50, 50 56, mm. 57, I think. Uh, but he was about 10 years older than me. And we wrote four songs for his album. And, um, oh, it was magic. It was magic because I knew, I knew, his, I knew his history, you know. And just uh, apart from writing with him, I wish I'd have known him for longer. Because we wrote together for six weeks, he was there for six almost every day in, during the week, and he wasn't drinking anymore. He'd bring two bottles of wine from his cellar every day and give me two bottles of wine and stuff. And uh, he was magic to be around. He was just so chilled. He was a New Yorker, hmm. and uh, I said, "I know most of your repertoire, more." And he said, "Yeah, you know them." He said, and I said, "Yeah, but." How many did you write for Elvis more? Well, I sat in the kitchen with him, you know. How many songs did you? These moments are just magic, you know. You, you yeah. should have spoken to him, you know. I said, How many songs did you write for Elvis? He said, About 30. Wow. You wrote 30 songs for Elvis. He said, A lot of them were crap. <laughs> I, wrote, 
I wrote for the movies. <laughs> I wrote for the movies. I said, yeah, but you wrote Little Sister. Little Sister, what a song for Elvis. Latest yeah. Flame for Elvis. You wrote uh, Mess of Blues, Viva Las Vegas. All these songs you wrote for Elvis. You wrote for Drifters. You wrote Save the Last Dance for Me. Wow. Can't Major get used hit. to losing you for Andy Williams, all these tunes, you know. He had, I said, what was Elvis like? What was Elvis like? I want to know. What was Elvis like? He went, I don't know. I never met him. Wow. How that's, about that? That's he said, Freddie, Freddie, Be Freddie Beanstock is publisher, who I met. I, I signed a song over to Elvis that he never did, but I signed it. And I signed it to a Freddie Beanstock at Carlin. And so I met him, you know. And Lieber and Stoller walked in, so I spent an hour chatting to them about Elvis, you know. They had no idea Elvis was about to die. This was in 77, you know. Uh, I said to Freddie, I played this song to Freddie Beanstalk. I said, everyone said this song would suit Elvis. So I've got permission. Ireland Music said they would, they would give 50% of their publishing to Elvis Music or Whitehaven Music or Gladys Music, these publishing companies. Uh, Elvis didn't do it, unfortunately, but, um, you know, Fr Freddie said, this song would suit Elvis. It would suit Elvis. He said, but Elvis hasn't recorded for two years. You know, he comes into Nashville and he records for four or five hours, five songs. You know, and he was doing all that, you know, and um, so, yeah, that was magic. Being, being with Mort was magic. Uh, I've had so many other things, you know. I started to write with a friend. I started to write with a friend. I heard this guy's, a guy called, do you know Robert Hart, a guy called Robert Hart? No. No, he's a great singer. He, he sings now in the Man for a Man Earth Band. Okay. I didn't know they are still around even. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they play all the time in Europe, all the time. Robert's a fantastic singer, but he's a good friend of mine, and you know, and uh, he told me about this guy called Chris Winter. And we became very, very, very close friends. Chris, he played me this song that Chris had written from the view, viewpoint of animals. He'd written this song called Mankind. That's pretty know. cool. Oh, oh. Break, broke my heart when I heard it. And uh, oh. Robert, Robert had recorded it, you know. You should hear this song called Mankind. What's this sound I heard, Mama? What's this sound, you know? And he talks about being a deer and then talks about being a seal. On the ship, you know, is mankind playing God again? He'll destroy us in the end. Maybe he'll feel oh. better then. Is mankind wow. playing God again? He'll only, he'll only, uh, he'll something to loot, but he'll only, he'll, he'll some thinks he'll win today. He'll only lose the day. Uh, but we put, he, is mankind playing God again. It was beautiful. And he, had, he God, played with these tunes. I'm a huge like, animal lover, so I'm going to listen to that. Yeah. Well, I'm vegan. Wow. I'm vegetarian. I, I was vegetarian. Well, I've been vegan for, I've been vegetarian for 40 years. Oh, that's cool. I, but, you know what, man? But, this is my first year. Next month, I switched to pescatarian. Oh, really? Okay. So I, I, yeah. I just switched, and I feel so good, man. It's like incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you do. I think it's a different. You are basically what you repeatedly do, and I think if you, that's how it is. Uh, he also wrote a song, a beautiful song called um, "A Little Love Is Overdue," which is a bit of Stevie Wonderish, but it's absolutely stunning. So I phoned him when I heard these songs. I'd never met him. And we became friends and started to write together. You know, such a beautiful chords and stuff and he wasn't a great um chorus writer but i thought i wrote choruses he writes good verses and stuff and writes great yeah, ideas yeah. so we got together do you know we get together and we get together it turned up he, he lived in bristol so for me it was like two out two and a half hours away it turned up on a thursday it's just one of those magic people that you meet in your life and you say, I'm so lucky to have him as a friend. And I think he felt the same way. But we'd sit and write. He'd sit down at the piano 
and I played always played the piano, but he'd sit down. He always wanted to sit down at the piano, and I'd stand and go, change that to a change that chord to a B <laughs> flat. Na, na, yeah, uh, uh, okay. Put another bass note. Put an E on that on that B flat. Put an E now an A seventh. You know, and that's kind of stuff. I was used to do that stuff. Right. Like, you know. So uh, we got so well. We turned up on a Thursday. We'd write. We'd write from the midday onwards, and in the evening we'd go out for dinner, and then we'd write on the Friday, go out for dinner on the Friday evening, and write on the Saturday. He'd be there on the Sunday, and we'd go for a Chinese or something or Thai Thai meal, and then you go back on the Monday, go home, and then we come back four weeks later and we do it again. You know, we did this for about ten years. Oh wow! So that's a long. That's a yeah. It's that's a lot so of good. Yeah. friendship. That's a long oh, friendship. God. You know, it's, it's a lot of time has, to spend he, with somebody. He has Parkinson's disease now. Oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. That oh, sucks. It's, it's, it's so it's such a beautiful man. It's it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful. He wasn't made for this world. And number three. Yeah. So we started to write. No, we started to write these tunes, and we write. We write all kinds of tunes. And we were writing quite into musical tunes, you know. And he, he'd come down with, with ideas. He'd say, we actually represented England in the, uh, the uh, uh, Euro Eurovision Song Contest. Out of 2,000 songs, the publisher sent in one of our tunes. And it won. The That's Chris so and I cool. Written. Yeah. And we did it. We did it like a queen, a queen kind of tune. We did it like that, but it ended up like a, a dance tune. No dream impossible. No dream impossible. No dream impossible. I love you, living with hope in your heart. No, in dreams we're invincible. Da 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 da. It was a beautiful tune. It was really good. It didn't win, but Britain never used to win. So um, we wrote this other tune. We started doing musical tunes. And uh, we wrote the song. Chris came in one day and he said, I've got this. He said, driving down, I've got this, got a title. I said, what's the title? He said, Hope. Great title. And I said, yeah, let's write something really, really sort of classy, a kind of a, I don't know, either a gospel kind of tune or Whitney, Whitney Houston kind of tune, you know, and it turned out to be No prayer sounds more beautiful than your name You bring the voice of hope to me again And when you rise to find your dream I will be your wings See your journey through You need hope there is always hope when you have a dream. Nothing's quite as bad as it may seem when your spirit's low with nothing to show. Look inside for love and you find hope. For there are times they fill the past when there is always, always one thing that will last. And when you find the van, your dream. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those, you know. It was a beautiful <laughs> tune. Well, it's just another tune that we did. About five years later, we get a, a call from the South African Embassy or somebody from associated with the South a African Embassy. So we've heard this song of yours. We want to use it for for the uh, South African Football World Cup. World wow. Cup. Wow. This turned into the most amazing thing. You know, this, but this, what happens in your life? Sony, uh, Sony said, we found this guy. We want to sing it. It's a black, a black tenor. They sent me this, they sent me this uh, DVD of this guy singing singing Puccini, Rossini, Verdi, singing all this, you know, but Nelson Dorma, Nelson Dorma, you know, yeah. singing this stuff. And he was singing this stuff, and they said they want him to sing the song. It is South African. Nelson Mandela loves his voice. So he sent over to my house, comes to my house. We do the demo at my house. He That's sings so it. funny. I engineered it. Uh... Chris was there as well. Chris, Chris was there, so we did it together. And uh, then it gets bigger and bigger. Then we put strings on it. We put like 
a 60 piece string section on it. Uh, it ended up Trevor Horn producing, producing the thing. Wow. He produced it in the end because it became this big, big thing. Uh, it came back to us. Somebody suggested Nelson Mandela should say a few words in the middle. <laughs> so, so Nelson Mandela said, would you ask the writers to do it? So I sat down, wrote all this inspirational stuff in the middle. Ooh. We had this South African choir on it as well. Da, 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 da. The generosity of the human spirit can overcome all adversity. With care and compassion, together we can create hope. There is always hope. Uh, so, so you wrote, you him. wrote, you wrote Mandela's. You wrote that speech for Mandela. Well, I wrote this. I wrote, I wrote the words, and it came back. I'd written these, not those words. I read, wrote different words. But Nelson Mandela, he was very ill at the time. He came back saying, "I want to write them." So we got to let him, let the great man write them, haven't you? So he wrote his own words. And they put it down and sent it to us. Wow. That's on the That's so, That turned into it's a called, whole big... Now it's called, it's called Mandela's Hope. But the idea, you see, Sony had this idea. Mandela's, Mandela's book was called Hope. His book, his autobiography okay. is called Hope. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all uh, basically... Um, you know, it's one of those things that happens. Uh, it was at the time who was pro who was president of America? It was Obama. Obama's autobiography is called Audacity of Hope. Okay, which is very strange. And so yeah, CBS is. had this thing. They had this link up. They had this link up with Oprah Winfrey, Nelson Mandela, uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, Obama had a link up. They were going to do it on the Oprah Winfrey show and said, would you go on the show as the writer, as a writer of it? I said, yeah, I'll do it. Of course I will. It was all ready. He, he had made um, Sipiwo, uh, Sipiwo had recorded the album of like old songs and stuff. In it was all ready to go. See, that's all ready to go. Sipiwo went into into hospital, he wasn't feeling well. Went into hospital and died. Thirty-eight years. This is the, the the tenor, the singer, the singer. Yeah, he died. Holy shit! He died, and so it's all finished. Didn't so the have whole a thing was wow. They still used the song at the opening ceremony, but they had no singer in the end. You know, everything was. So they chilled. just they played it. They, they played, played it. it. Yeah, they played yeah. it. They played it, and somebody wow, sang it. Wow, that's tragic. Wow, that's tragic. You're very sad. Yeah. And what would be the the third top musical experience? I had so many, you know. Um, I was going back for a few years. When I was 20, um, when I was in the band The Roulettes, we were doing sessions and things like that, a lot of sessions and whatever. And a Frenchman came over to London to... to uh, we were asked to do this TV series called A Tale of Two Rivers, where French artists would come to London and sing by the Thames. I mean, this was a typical 60s thing, you know, magazine program. Right. So French, uh, you had uh, Richard Anthony, Marion Faithful uh, I did a song, Lulu did a song. But they went over to Paris and sang by the Seine, and the Frenchman came up. Richard Anthony was a, a famous French singer in the 60s, came over, and we backed him. And, um, you know, when, after we backed him, he said, he said I'm, going to, I'm going to France. I'm going to tour in France for, it's going to be like four months. He said, would you come and back, back us? I'd love you to back us, you know. So we, uh, we said, you know, where are we going to be? He said, well, we'll be, we'll be based in Saint-Tropez. But uh, and we obviously keep That's him in a miserable, hotel. That's eh? <laughs> miserable, Be based in Saint-Tropez. <laughs> but we travel all over with all the casinos of Europe, uh, all the best casinos, which is what we did. You know, we played in Spain, 
Italy. We went to Corsica. We went to Via Reggio, Rimini. Uh, and we flew everywhere in his plane, you know, his own plane. He flew his own Private plane. Private jet, yeah. Yeah, this wasn't a jet. It was a prop. It was a Piper, a Piper Aztec, actually. So, but um, he was getting a jet. He was getting a, a Beechcraft. Uh, oh, that was magic. I was going to say they—they they were just magic times. Just, just because twenty years old, you're traveling all over Europe, and um, it was just—I yeah, can't remember imagine. that as a magic time. The first tour God, of yeah. the states. First tour of the states was great, though. That tops it. The first tour of the states in ninety-seven. With Argent. Yeah. Yeah. That was three months. Uh, that was magic. Thank you for sharing that. That was cool. Yeah. I. Okay. In um. I went through your catalog. We talked a little bit about this before we started recording, and I was listening to a lot of the tracks and reading all the lyrics and you appeared to me to be someone who's definitely more a looks at life as a glass half full than a glass half empty. You're very positive. And, and even in our brief email exchanges, you came across like, in fact, I noted it because that was, it was, um, you know, it was like that came through, you know, I pay attention to stuff like that. Yeah. And I was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you just would, it was just like really like, oh, you know, the, it, it wasn't like, you know, just normal like correspondence. It was just like really positive. And I, <laughs> and I appreciate that. I appreciate that, you know? Yeah. Um, I was curious if you've always been like that. And if so, where did you get that? How did that evolve? Or did you work to become like that? Again, I think it's probably a lot to do with genetics because my mum and dad seem pretty positive, you know. Uh, they were positive people. And um, I, I think that gave me a great start in life, being around that atmosphere. I mm. had a great family, a great family thing. Um, I think really, to be honest, I became more and more positive. as I, As I said before, as I came out of depression, it was like, do you know, I think I'm so glad to be alive. I thought every day when I was depressed, I thought, am I going to die today? Am I going to die tomorrow? You know, when I wake up the next day, you know. Uh, and it was one of those sort of things. When you come out of it, you just come out of it. The other end, it's like. Yeah, but you, you just, stuck to it. I stuck you to know, it. You like, know, it's like a lot of people say, oh, I'm never going to drink again. You know, and then like it's Friday, they're in the pub, I have, right? I have one gin and tonic, one gin yeah. and tonic every every week. I'm no, 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 great. not you. No, no, not you. No, I'm saying how. <laughs> no, I'm not. Talking, I'm saying, but you know how some people say, "Oh, I'm going to never drink again," and you said, "Oh, I'm going to look at every day positive," but you stuck with it. Yeah, no, that's I what do. I'm saying. I do. That's I do. that was unusual. I do. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you didn't always... take it for granted. No, no. Isn't that weird? Well, it's but it I'm, is unusual, yeah. It's it's and it, it reflected in my songs. In my, I did I did right. a lot of it. I it did reflect in my songs. I was I wanted to say to people, you know, it's something about saying. You know, I was able to do it. The idea of being able to put, you can say something to somebody, and it doesn't mean a lot, but you can sing the words to somebody, and it means more. If you say. Thunder and lightning is striking you down and you feel in your head there's no one around. Kick out the trouble standing in your way. Look outside, it's a brand new day. You know the moment, you know the sign. There won't be a mountain that you can't climb. You know what it is when it comes inside. It can be any time of the day or night. Get up, get up, get back on your feet. Bang the drum and start the beat. Get out, get out, get out on the street. Dance away your troubles out on the street. It's your time to win. Your time to break out. Your time to take out all you put in. Your time is going to come. Da 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 da. Your time is going to come. Da da da. <laughs> and yeah, I'm totally wondering. different. It made me feel it. good. Right. If it makes me feel good, you're the same as me. You're not separate from me. If it makes me feel good, you tell a joke, somebody laughs. <laughs> you, yes. you tell something, say something sad, and the other person feels we are related as human yeah. beings. Totally. We're related. So say something good. Say something. Make peace. People feel good. Tell them 
This is how I feel. You can feel the same way. You're not going to feel any different. Just, you know, but this is music that's done this to me. Yeah. It's music more than anything. It's music that uh, I go in the studio, you know, and every day is going to be blissful. Not every day, not as blissful as maybe that day, but it's going to be blissful. I come in, you know, you're either going to have an idea for a song, you put down the drums, you put down a few chords, you come in feeling great at lunchtime. You've got this to look forward to, to go back in there and develop, and you write some words to it. You write some more words to it. You put down the chorus. Oh, this chorus is so good. It's such a good chorus. It reflects in what you're doing, you know. Yeah. You realize spirit. There's a spirit there that's um, undeniable. For me, it's undeniable. Yeah. And you, because you're the same as me, you're not separate from me. Nor is the guy in Russia, actually. Correct. If it's put on a different head, you know. And the idea is finding the passion. It's finding that passion. I realize the passion with passion. Our education in the world should be passion. Should be something you should find everybody's passion and follow it. But follow that passion. Everybody, that should be the education, not following loads of history and geography and science. And, yeah. uh, da, 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 and you follow this and you follow that. You should follow their, find their passion and go with it. Everybody should have a passion that they can follow. And they wake up every day looking forward to every day. You don't go through a life saying, oh, God, I don't want to do this debate. Oh, I never feel like that when I'm doing music. Right. I learned that from doing this show, from talking to hundreds of artists like you. You and don't, you changed, know, it, it's, it's a my whole life. different ball game. You know, you speak to Roger, you speak to musicians, and they all say the same stuff. You know, they say when you're around them, you know, I've never written with many people, but now I write with people that are 25 years younger than me, and they are just the same. There's no generation gap when I'm writing. Yeah, they will tell I'm you. Sure. If you speak to Space Elevator, you speak to Fugitive and the guys. There's a guy called Marley Davidson who's a very talented kid. He's 30 years old and he's phoning me all the time, you know, and he's writing his own. He doesn't need me to write with him. He's a great writer. But Marley Davidson, his name is, is great. He's, he's it a is great. It's it great. I mean, there's, these kids are great, you know, and you're writing with them and there's no separation. It's well, magic. you crawled out of a hole and your life became blissful, but you kept it like that. And I think that's what's, re you know, I think that's a choice. I mean, I know it's a feeling, but I think there's a choice involved. I mean, like everything else, you have a choice. How are you going to look at today? Is it going to be half full, half empty? Is it going to be, you know, I, I have developed the mindset that anything that happens to me is good. And I never had that as a younger person. Like if, if yeah, it's, maybe, even if yeah. the outcome's bad, it's going to be good because I don't know where that bad is going to take me next. I don't know it at that moment, but, you know, eight months down the road, I could say, hey, thank God that happened because X, Y, Z, you know? And I so, agree. yeah, I think it's, I think, I think you have to, I think that's a conscious, a daily almost conscious decision, you know, that you have to it's make. Funny as well, Craig, it's funny as well, Craig, it's funny. When you speak to a like-minded person, you know, you're, you, you've got that sort of high qualities of the mind kind of thing going on, you know. It, you, you do go, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, but, it, but it, it's, it's a higher kind of conversation as well, isn't it? When you get into it, you know, and it's such a positive conversation. Yeah, and you it find feels it good. Lot, you find it with a lot of musicians that they've thought about it, especially, mm -hmm. especially songwriters and all that, you know, and they understand, musicians understand, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, <laughs> other stuff, you know. Um, yeah. And I just wish politicians, I wish politicians, if they only, if they found music, they wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want to go to war. You know, they wouldn't want to go to war, you know. And I say, before you, before you, you know, you decide to be a politician, put your own house in order. Yeah. And then be a politician. Right. Put your own house in order first, because they haven't, you know. They've got yeah. this blind ambition. They want to get somewhere. And they want to. They obviously want to become. What's What's the number one for them? What's being number one? Number one is not being at the top of the charts. It's being president or it's being prime minister. And they get yeah, there not knowing the thing is. what they're doing, and they don't have any higher qualities of the mind. They don't. They don't think like this. They don't think about. You know, they don't think. They, they think priorities. 
know, they yeah. have different priorities. I yeah. don't know. I'm, I don't yeah. know. It's different. It's it's a different different thing, you know. Um, it's very very sad because people are suffering because you haven't got you don't get you don't get uh, really spiritual people being heads of countries. Uh, really, no. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't appear that way. <laughs> you know, when you look, I mean, they may talk a good. They talk a good game or like, well, I'm in church every Sunday. That's got nothing to do with freaking spirituality. To me. Nothing. 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 To do nothing with spirituality. With it. Yeah. yeah nothing, I agree nothing with you to do on with that. It. It's nothing to do with it. You know, so. And you wouldn't go to war anyway. You wouldn't go to war. So, I mean, it's. Uh, it's a different, whole different mindset. You know, it's a big, big, big question. And it's going to require a big, big answer somebody greater than me <laughs> <laughs> well you, you know i just want to tell you, you mentioned uh um jerry lieber i had his son oliver on my show recently very successful oh, yeah. songwriter i could yeah. send you the you mentioned how this other guy was an alcoholic jerry was a raging alcoholic was he yeah and his kids were not allowed to see him unless they called his secretary and made an appointment to you come down to, I swear to God, I'll, I'll send wow. you Oliver's interview. And unless he made an appointment to come down to the studio and then he, they could sit outside while he was inside producing. Really? They couldn't go wow. Yeah. I, yeah. Went to one, I went to one of his sessions, you know, in New York. I went to a Jerry Lieber session. Up in the Brill Building there? No, 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 no. This was an actual session at the... Um, oh, in a studio. Okay. Yeah, what's the studio in... What's one of the like famous studios? CBS, maybe? No. There was... Uh, no. The... the, uh, uh, the um, there was not so the many power in the Not the power station. That's what I was thinking of, the power station. No, not the power station. It, it was... Um, it's one of the others. I saw Gary Brooker. He was in the same hotel as me. Gary That's Brooker. Wild. This is when I was doing in 1975 when I went to do um, I went to do Rogers the cut of his album, and I saw Gary because I knew Gary from 19, 1965. This is ten years later, you know. That's crazy. We're in, the we're in the same. We're in the same. I said, "What are you do?" He said, "What are you doing here?" What, I said, "What are you doing here?" He said, "That's um, crazy." He said, "He said I'm putting some Jerry Lieber." I think Lieber and Stoll actually produced their album, Procol Harum. They produced that album. They did produce an album for them, you know, and he said, Jerry Lieber's putting, Jerry Lieber's putting this uh, brow section on uh, one, of, one of the songs. They were doing a Lieber and Stoll song. They were doing, I keep forgetting. Do you remember I keep forgetting? You're too young to remember this. You say, I'm too young to yeah. remember it, really, to be honest. I keep forgetting you don't love me no more. Da, 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 da. No, I don't know that one. keep forgetting you don't want me no more. Da, 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 da. And he put a brass section on it. And I went along with Gary. Oh, God, I can't remember the name of the studio. Can't remember the name of the studio. But it was in New York, yeah. That's wild. But yeah, I'll send you that yeah. interview if you want to check it out. Um, I want to talk to whatever extent you're comfortable, Russ. You released in 2020 an album called It's Good to Be Here. Beautiful album, great songwriting, vocals, guitar, excellent on there. The first track, though, was pretty heavy. It's called My Awakening. And I was curious, again, to whatever extent you're comfortable, between the title of It's Good to Be Here and then the lyrics of My Awakening, I was curious if that song or the album was written in response to something going on in your life at that particular time well at that time uh i just i started to write for an album i thought and i just signed a new publishing deal with bmg uh i set up my own publishing but i i, I signed this deal with them and i went to uh I went to the head of BMG at the time and said, you know, would you, if I make an album, would you release it? He said, yeah, of course. So, so I felt really inspired. It's one of those moments that I, God, I'm doing a new album. And at that time, I've never stopped doing it, Craig. And that is the thing, you know. And so, um, you know, what you repeatedly do, 
to keep the muscle memory and stuff like that, you know. And I'm still writing every day. I was in the studio before I came in here. Uh, so I'm doing it every day still, you know. And I this, this is my awakening. That was the idea. And I thought um, it's a nice idea for... Uh, I wrote down a few little things here. I said, yeah, they offered me a deal, record and publish. I felt very inspired. Yeah, I, I said I'd work with a title or a lyric, and that's that was the idea. I had the title, and I thought, this is you know this is going to be my new album. And so, but now I've got some great ideas. I've done another album since then. I've got another <laughs> album that I did in the lockdown that's not been released. So I'm trying to find. I've got two albums that need to be released. I've got one that I did in the lockdown, 2020. Got some great tunes on there. The people that have heard them, well, I think they're great anyway. I think they've worked out really well. Uh, they will come out sometime. You know, it's so. funny. You remind me. I, I, You're like the guy you can never retire because like, you have so much things you need to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, and I, I want to keep going. I want to be a hundred, yeah. 110, 120 if possible. I run every day. I have a, I have a trainer on Fridays, every Friday morning at seven fifteen. Uh, I run every day, and I've always done it. That's I run, great. I, I run in the morning. I get up, and run, and then I go in the studio, and you feel alive because you get the endorphin, serotonin rush. You know, totally. So. I, I do that, and then in the I come out, have lunch, and then I go for a run in the afternoon. Oh, so you so, run twice a day. Twice a day. I run oh, that's twice a good day. for you, yeah. man. Well, you've twice. always been really fit and really slim. I noticed that in all the photos no, that I no, was looking I, at. Yeah, they, you always took yeah, care of yourself. I, I, I want to live. I want to live as long as possible. My brother died at fifty-one. My dad was sixty. Whatever his brother was sixty something. My mum was eighty-nine. And so I'm hoping I'm going to, I've got her genes. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, seems like I don't it. know, but uh, oh, oh, her brother died at nine, 98. He fell over, basically. Oh, my God. I thought he was going to live to 102, 103. I said to him, what's the secret? What's the secret? And he said, I don't think I, I, don't think I worry, Russ. And he was 98, you know. He was in wow. the hospital. Wow. I don't think I worry. But you know, That's I awesome. breathe. I spend a lot of time breathing, and it's the biggest gift. You might say, "How do you breathe when you speak so much?" <laughs> I didn't think you, mean, you could breathe. I thought you. you mean, what do you mean? You breathe. spend time breathing? Conscious. Like breathing. you meditate and you conscious. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, you breathe it's through the, your nose, right? Breathe from my nose. Yeah, yeah, I breathe through my nose, but conscious breathing, as long as you're concentrating on the breathing, and it's the biggest gift that we have that we don't use, you know. And I've done it for years. I did it with the first Dan Millman when Dan Millman put out a set of um, basically Peaceful Warrior sort of meditations, and it was like cassettes. And I found mm. them the other day. I've still got them in there. Uh, that was 19, that was got to be 30. 35 years ago we put these things out and they were wonderful you know and it's uh, meditation is part of it um, and it does something to your head it just does something it changes your psyche it's Breathing. amazing you realize you've got mm. to do it you've got to do it but it takes it you've got to treat it like you're learning the piano or learning the guitar you're yeah if, I you've, see got that. To, you've got to study it the same and you realize the first thing you do when you're born is you breathe. The last thing you do when you die is you breathe your last yeah. breath. And you realize that, oh, God, it's, if you make it a habit and turn it into, you know, a muscle memory kind of thing, you know, because you have these, you can find these, you can find these things online. They're good. You know, things like calm, calm is very good. Yeah, yeah. And they've got they've got these. Um, Jeff Warren does a great thing on there as well. He does a great thing, but it, they all say the same thing. It's the breathing. It's the actual thing about breathing. You consciously breathe in, consciously breathe out. 
And you're going to get thoughts come. You're going to get thoughts, uh, mind wandering, daydreams, you know, all this kind of stuff. They're going to keep coming because that's part of being human. The key is to get rid of them. Yeah, that, clear out I the found clutter. them to be destruct. I found them to be destructive. You know, you often have those kind of thoughts. Get rid of those. Get rid of just get rid of those. So every time you have a thought, mind wandering, a daydream, anything like that, you breathe. So you make that a habit. But anytime you get something like that, a daydream will come in. Breathe. It's what people do when they smoked a cigarette years ago. When they smoke a cigarette, you sing a that would give them, they feel comfortable, but it's not that, it's the actual act of breathing. You're probably right on that, yeah. I used to say to my wife, stop doing that, Janet, you know, just breathe. But she was so hooked on the, uh, on the um, nicotine, obviously she was hooked on it. But just breathe because you get the same kick, you get this. <sighs> yeah, I used to smoke, you're 100% right. It wasn't the s smoking, it was the... <sighs> The peaceful exhalation, the peaceful exhaling. That gets, Craig, that gets better and better and better. It will change yeah. your life. It will change. Yeah. Do it. It will change your life. You'll come back to me in yeah. a year, so I'm saying, Russ, you don't know what you've done telling me that. I promise yeah. you. Okay. But, and don't worry if you lose it, you haven't lost it. You think you've lost Ah, then you realize you go back to breathe and you realize it's all still there and it gets stronger and stronger. You feel more cool, chilled, and you get I do deeper. meditate periodically, and, I, and I've noticed now that I automatically, like if I'm stressed about something, which thank God doesn't happen very often, but I do start breathing right away, and I'm like, okay, first of all, let me just That's chill it. out immediately and like settle myself, and then usually everything goes away. Well, that's but, the key. Um, that is yeah. the key. It gets deeper and deeper. You will... You, I don't, didn't realize as an organism how you can change so much from this person that could get angry or could get sort of, in the end, you just, nothing chills you, uh, nothing, uh, uh, you're chilled about everything. Yeah, well, well, I also have a viewpoint of how other people think of me or how, uh, what other people do is none of my business. Well, that's good. So I don't really get bent out of shape about it. You know, if someone leaves a nasty comment on a yeah, YouTube, I don't really care. That's very common for, the, for humanity. That's very common. Most humans are worried about what does he think about, what does she think about me, what does that, that, that. And you know, they don't give a monkeys about you. No, I don't they give say a how shit. how it affects no. them. <laughs> that's how it I affects them because we're the same. We're not separate from each other, but we have the potential to be chilled. Everyone has that potential. Yeah. This is why they're making, I think probably in the States as well, they're making a big thing about mindfulness. Oh, it's huge here. Yeah, it's, it's huge. huge here. It's huge, you know, and I know it's been like this in LA for a long, long time, this kind of, uh, there's been that, but you don't know how much of it is really... Um... It's pomp and circumstance. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. LA is... It's not really, it's know, not the rest of the... It's a nice sound to say, it's a nice sound to say, I meditate. Yeah. I don't it's... say, I don't say meditate, I usually say breathing because it's... No, I like, I'm going to, I'm going to do some, I'm going to look at some YouTube videos on that because I do enjoy look that up, and I do look up get Jeff a lot. Warren. He does a 30, okay. he does a 30 day, he does a 30 day course. Okay. I will check it out and he for does sure because I, I do like it. He does it from beginning to end. And there's a great one when he gets to, there's one, the Cosmic Burpee, which is about about three from the end. It's about, it's about um, day 20, out of 30 days, it's about day 28, something like that. And he talks about, he said, here I am. He said, you know, basically, uh, awareness. The idea, when you get these, when you get these thoughts, mind wanderings, daydreams come, you get them, you know. The idea is to give them bigger, it's like training, it's like training sheep or cattle. You give them a bigger grazing field. So you give your thoughts, mind wanderings and things, you give them a bigger grazing field. So you keep them further and further, get them further and further away from you. So they go further, the more you, you breathe when they come, you breathe, they come, you breathe, they go further and further away, and in there you notice they're not there anymore. Yeah. That's the key.
That is the yeah, key. When yeah, they're there, sure. you keep doing it until they're not they're not there anymore, worrying you. Right. And so you've right. got so much more. You go deeper into yourself, and there's something that happens. You become more sane. You became more friendly. Oh, it all changes. Everything you become less egotistical of everything. It's just a different life, and it's a wonderful life. And so that's that's what you do. So, and he says in Cosmic Burpee, he said, you know, he said, and he talks. He talks about. Every meditation only lasts for 10 minutes, 10 or 12 minutes every day, lasts 10 or 12 minutes. Which is perfect. It's on to the for next me. one. It's on to the next one. So, but you've got to do it every day. Do it every day if possible. And you will want to do it every day anyway. So, no, if I commit to it, I'll do it every day. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, you'll do it every yeah, day. Yeah. With mind wandering, with mind wandering and uh, awareness, he does a great one. He says, you know, it's awareness. He said, the, there's only one awareness. He said, it's not your awareness and their awareness. And when it's, there's only one awareness, and that's the universe. Yeah. And the universe, you're part of the universe. We come from the universe. We're not separate from the universe. We're part of the universe. The Big Bang, and we turn into, from the Big Bang, we turn into you and me and eyes, skin, nose, talking together. Yeah. Think about that. But it comes from the universe. The universe is awareness, and the universe is, listen to me, part of the universe, talking to you, listening to me, part of the universe. It's a, because it, this is a cosmic burpee, you know, it's wonderful stuff. I'll check it it's out. Mind I, I, it's mind-blowing, yeah. but, you know, when you get into it, it's, it's wonderful. It really sort of enhances your life, and... Um, and friendliness as well, you know. I think I've always been friendly, actually. I tried to be a bit moody when I was younger because I thought it was cool. <laughs> it didn't suit you. <laughs> but I was never happy doing it, you know. But I was pretty friendly, I was pretty friendly anyway, you know. <laughs> hey, let me, uh, I want to ask you about your guitar. Your, uh, your Holy Strat. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I know you mostly played Les Pauls. And then you got this Holy Strat. I'd love you to... Share the story I had the about strat that. First in Argent, I used the strat. I used the holy strat with Argent, and then I got them with to the hole with the holes in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, go to Russ's website. It's was it RussBallardMusic.com? Yeah, that is that's Sven's. That's Sven's. That's mu that's music. Yeah, yeah. That's okay, Sven. well, Sven's Sven, what's the but, but Sven runs my he runs that okay. website for me. Yeah, but it's a pretty extensive site. There's a lot of information, but I've never, I've never, ever seen a guitar like that, ever in my life. I mean, it's, 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 what, tell the story about it. It's really weird almost, you know? Yeah, well, I had, I had that come around. I was in a band then called Unit 4 Plus 2. Mm -hmm. That's before I, right. you know. I read about that. Yeah, that, that was, was the plus, plus two was you and Bob, right? Uh, Bob, uh, Bob, yeah. Bob, I was yeah. a guitar player. Bob was a drummer. They didn't have a mm. guitar player and a drummer. So basically, we started going out. They said, will you join us when the roulette split? He said, will you join us? We did a tour with them. Then I, then we started Argent. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, um, with the Unit 4 Strat. Plus 2, they had another guitar player called Buster Meikle. He was, he was a good singer, actually, Buster. He had a, he was a rhythm guitar player, you know, he had a black Strat. And he said to me, I'm going to sell my guitar, do you want to buy it? Black Strat. So I looked at it, I pulled it off of him, and I thought, I tell you what's happening at the time, you, I don't know if you remember, you're probably too young to remember this, but at that time in the 60s, in the late 60s, they had those, um, a lot of furniture had holes cut in it, like you'd get um, you would get oh, those, like uh, retro sort of aluminium, yeah. aluminium chairs who used to have holes cut in them and things, and they were very light as well. You could pack, you could pile chairs up, and you you'd have a dozen chairs all in a pile. You could move them around. It was very clever and aluminium, aluminium, aluminium. Here. Was, they, <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, translate yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they would they would uh, they would pile the chairs up and walk around with these different chairs and stuff. And I thought I'd love to holes cutting my guitar. 
I said to my friend Jim Wilkinson, who was he was at the Royal College of Art. Is is I that said, the same Jim, Wilkinson? Wilkinson Bridges, and is that the same guy? No, I don't know him. Okay, he, there's no, a no. Wilkinson, like a uh, it's a it's a like a uh, whammy bar. Wilkinson, like a whole oh, unit. Oh right, I just, okay, a whammy bar on the guitars. No, yeah, no, it's a Wilkinson. No, 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 okay, no, 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 Different this guy. guy. This guy wasn't even a musician. He was more of a. He was. He did. He did the. Uh, he did the graphics on the first Arnold stuff. He did the. He did okay. the, uh, the strange. The strange uh, alphabet he did. But he was a pretty good artist. And I said, "Can you cut some holes in this and do some stuff on it? You know, I like some holes cutting it and make it look metal like the chairs. Make it look like it's metal." So he did it and. Uh, yeah, that was it, you know, so that's how that came about. He just that randomly was... cut, like, how did he know, like, he just randomly cut those holes? Yeah. Daughtry's but it's really one, you know? smooth. It's, it's like, it looks really smooth in there, like, kind of like those retro, you know, era 60s stuff. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. He's, he did it pretty well. He did it, yeah, he did it pretty well. Uh it's funny, I did a video with Roger when we did his album at Shepperton, and Roger said, I really like that guitar. And because the, Roger Daltrey you're talking about now. It's, yeah, it's Roger Daltrey. Yeah. It's, it, because it, it was at the film studio, there were carpenters there, chippies, you know, and electricians and things there, you know, and he said to the chippy there, he said, he said can you cut some, like this, see, see his guitar, can you cut some holes in that like that? <laughs> and he came back and half an hour later, all these holes cut in the guitar. And it, that was a Les Paul. Somewhere, there's a Roger Daltrey gu guitar with holes in it like that. That is so funny. But it's a Les Paul. I don't know if he's still now, got it. How did he that change? Did it change the sound? Or? I don't think so. I used it. I used it on Hold Your Head Up. I used it on, um, I used it on God Gave Rock and Roll to You. That's amazing. It's such a, yeah. a beautiful, it's like a, it kind of looks like a, something you'd see on the wall, hanging on the wall. Stay there, just a sec, just a sec. Yeah, man. I hope he's bringing back his guitar. You guys got to see this. It's, I've never seen anything like it. This is, um, it's a different neck now. It's oh, different... this is, I mean, I've, that is so cool looking. Now, Ibanez has something that, like, but it's nothing like that. It's just a whole no. hand. Yeah. That is phenomenal. Oh, this, and and what year is that? This is 65. That is so cool, man. I have Can you show that one more time, please, Russ? Huh? Can you show that one more time? Oh, man. And it it, it always had the humbucker in there? Or did you put that in? Uh, no, I put the humbucker in there. I bought when I first in 1970, we went to the states. Beautiful, uh, man. And in 1970, put they put the humbuckers in. But whereas this is, yeah, I bought two humbuckers. They were thirty five dollars each. <laughs> thirty five dollars each, and uh, that's amazing. I I had I forget somebody put it in for me. I I'm not not good at that kind of stuff. Somebody put it in for me. That's really uh, cool. What a beautiful guitar, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, is, that, is that your number one? Sorry, is that your number one? Yeah, like yeah, your number yeah. one guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I still, I've got it in the house, fun enough. So I, I've been using, I've been, I've been playing it in the house. So it was there, fun enough, when you were talking about it. Yeah, that's so cool. And do you still play Les Pauls? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a tour of Germany, of southern Germany, in um. In April, and I'm doing a rock, rock classic, a rock classic um, tour, and um, Midjure's doing it as well. That's Remember wild. Midjure? He's doing it. Yes. I'm doing it. Uh, a couple of famous Germans are doing it. A couple of Super Tramp are doing it as well. But I'm special guest artist, very special guest artist. Actually, they've got on the on of the course. bill, which is quite nice. Doing, I'm only doing like five songs each. Which is quite nice, you know, with a sixty-piece orchestra. Oh wow! So that's going to be interesting. So uh, they're renting me. They said, "Are you going to bring a guitar?" I said, "Yeah." Well, I, I hope I can. I hope I'm allowed. And they said, "Yeah, of course." Uh, 
do you want us to rent anything? I said, yeah, rent me a Les Paul as well, will you? So basically, I'd be able to change around. Or if I break a string, I can change rather than do anything else. So, uh, yeah, they're getting all the gear for me. Robert Hart's That's doing cool. it as well. Oh, the guy who did the who wrote yeah. the Mankind. Yeah, no, he, he he didn't write it. No, he didn't write it. It was Chris Winter wrote it. It was Robert oh, okay. told me. Robert told me about Chris Winter. Okay. He told me about Chris. Yeah, and that's how we got together. No, Robert. He sings from man from man. Right. That's what you told me. Yeah, yeah. Russ, tell me the uh, funniest or most embarrassing thing ever happened to you on stage or in the studio. Well, throwing that guitar up for a start. <laughs> I That's used to do, we, we used to do, we used to, and we used to, and we used to do, uh, hold your head up and end with, uh, hold your head up, woman, hold your head up, woman, hold your head up, woman, hold your head up, woman. And I used to swing the guitar around like that and throw it in the air. <laughs> Holy and the idea crap. was the guitar comes down, grab the guitar, lights go out, finish. Okay. This time I threw the guitar up, the lights went out, and it just landed on my nose. That was a good one. And blood went, whoosh, broke my nose. Oh, my the, God. Uh, that was a strange one. What else? Uh, there was a strange one. The worst thing that we ever did, it was painful. When I say I love music, I love doing music. Do what you can do, but don't try and do things you can't do. You know what I'm saying? Years ago, mm -hmm. when we were in the roulettes, this is going back to the 60s, we thought we could actually earn some good money doing cabaret because the, there was a band called the Baron Knights. Used to go, they were very, very funny. They could sing songs and be very, very funny. They used to have hit records as well. There's a band called the Rockin' Berries, used to do cabaret. They could do cabaret and do entertaining stuff, doing everything, you know, doing humor <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we thought we could do it. Somebody said, if you could do the humor with, in your set, you could earn big money for a week, a week in the miners' clubs and places like that. So we got this, this set together, and it was embarrassing. You know, we weren't funny. We could play rock and roll, which was what they wanted. We were trying to do tap dancing and sort of uh, humor. That was embarrassing. That was just, we, we were doing me and my shadow, and the bass player was tap dancing on the, you know, on the stage. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Didn't work well for you guys. Yeah, no, 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 no. That was, that was a bad one. This is a tough question for someone like you, especially as such a music lover. Tell me your top three. Desert Island CDs. Oh, God. Just for this moment, you know, because that changes moment, every day. Um, for this moment, uh, I Love Iris by Goo Goo Dolls. Really? Okay. I love that song. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Something about that song, I think it's magic. Uh, it's pretty, really pretty song. That's uh, beautiful, yeah. Um, I loved, there was a thing, there was a thing called, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think, I'm just trying to think what his name was. Uh, I loved Drops of Jupiter by Train. That was a great tune. Do you remember Drops of Jupiter? I don't know that song, but I do know Train. I had the guitar player on here a while back. Yeah, that was. That was a that was a great song. Um, I loved. Uh, there's some classical things. I love N Ness and Dormer. I love that song. I love uh, Beethoven's um, Moonlight Sonata, which is a beautiful tune. You know, I mean, there's four there, isn't there? There's four. Um, there's just too many, you know. There's just too many. I know. It's a very tough question, man. There's just too many. Just a few more questions, uh, Russ, and I really appreciate This has been a lot of fun, and I really appreciate your time, man. 
Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your accident. You had a childhood accident, left you blind in one eye, and your doctors tried to save your vision through 10 operations over three years, which I can't imagine mm. how stressful mm. that was, but it didn't work. Tell, tell me about that accident and how it impacted your life and your outlook on things. Yeah, it's a strange one. I can only, I don't know what I would have done had I not have ac had the accident. Maybe the accident was a catalyst for me to be to be so uh, disciplined. Maybe it was the accident that did that. I don't know. I don't know what I was like before. I know I was like mad about football before I was hit. Um, now, when I was when I was young, I was very extrovert, Craig. I was very, very extrovert. I was like standing on my head in, in restaurants and things, <laughs> on the tables and things. When I was six, <laughs> when I was seven, you know, it must have been the most That's hilarious. Precocious, precocious kid. But my mum and dad used to let me do it, you know, which was dreadful. They must have thought, what a precocious brat. But I used to uh, do it. Uh, but... Um, Trying to get my train of thought here, you know. Um, I just remember, I liked fun. I liked a lot of fun with my friends. I used to knock at my door, like, in, in the summer holidays. And this was a particular summer holiday. The kids had knocked at my door and said, do you fancy coming out? We're going to go We're going to go up to the woods. There were woods very close to where we were. They were called Temple Bar Woods, which was about a mile a mile and a half from my house. And as we were walking along the road, there were about seven guys, all about my age, probably a little bit older, 14, 15. And as I was walking, I was 12, nearly 13. As we were walking along the road, I noticed they had slug guns, pellet guns, and they had catapults and things like that. They were going to go and which scared the life out of me, you know, I just knew something bad was going to happen. I I was hit, you know, they started shooting these guns around. When you say and catapult, I, like a slingshot, that's a slingshot, a slingshot over there, right? A slingshot yeah. hit, me, hit yeah. me in the eye. Then it was one of those, bang, you know, and I, I don't know how I survived it, to be honest, but I was rushed at, after about two hours because I walked home. I was carried half the way home. And my mum and dad didn't realise how badly I was hit. You know, I was trying, I was trying not to. Uh, I remember my dad playing the piano, and I was saying, "Dad, don't play, don't play. That's killing me. It's killing my head." You know, and he said, "You shouldn't go and play. You shouldn't go out there with catapults and guns and things like that." You know, slug guns. But I did, and then I was rushed to hospital. I had both my eyes covered up for two weeks in in an eye hospital, Moorfields Eye, eye Hospital in London. Both eyes covered up, which was a strange experience as well. That's enough to slow you down. Yeah, I can't imagine how creepy yeah, that was. Both, eye, both eyes covered up for two weeks. They had to let, they were trying. To, it would be a very different. People have told me, I've spoken to doctors recently, you know, and they said it would be, it would have been very different had it have been now. Of course. They would have saved the eye. They would have, da, 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 you, you know, all these things. It, it wouldn't have been the same, you know. So, um, that's what happened there, you know. I just started to play the guitar, the acoustic guitar, like a Spanish guitar at that time. And um, mum said, you know, if you know, if you keep doing well, I'll bet get you electric guitar. And then I'll buy you an amplifier. And you know, she was so uh, upset what happened to me. But um, yeah, I mean. It probably it made me very introverted, but what I used to do is when I came when I came out of hospital after three weeks, uh, I really got into playing guitar, and I wouldn't go out. And I was always playing football before. I was always active, you know. And kids were knocking at my door saying, "Is Russ coming out to play football? Or is Russ coming in?" You know, and my dad's like, "Get out there and play. Get out and play with your friends." And I just, all I was interested in was sitting over this fire, playing the guitar. And that's how my life went, you know. I did that for about three years, just sitting over a fire playing guitar. I was just so embarrassed about myself, embarrassed about my life, embarrassed about what I looked like as well. 
and uh, I mean it's stupid to say, but um, you know, I just I just became completely introverted into this. I wanted to be do this, which is be a guitar player. You know, and that's how it was. Do Do you think? We talked earlier, like about spirituality. Do you think, or have you ever looked at this that, hey, that was, you know, your higher power or whoever it is, is way of putting you towards music? Because you probably wouldn't have hit it as hard. You wouldn't have been sitting home every day for, for hours and hours a day if you're still running around outside playing football. Do you know, I think you might have something there. Yeah, I'm sure there was, I've said to people recently, there's something going on that, there's something going on that we don't understand. There's a lot more to it. You know, people, as human beings, we look at life, we look at being born, living a life, and then popping off and doing whatever we do. But there's something, something going on. Um, but that day when I was hit, it sounds crazy to talk about this like this, but something happened that, that I knew I was going to be hit. It's almost I brought it on myself. I knew I was going to be hit. And I've never said, never said this before like this to anyone online or anything. I've never said this. I've said it, I've said it to a couple of people, people I'm very close to. I knew I was going to be hit. I remember people... About four guys with slug guns. We call them slug guns. Yeah, we call them slug guns. They said pellet guns, but they were dangerous, you know. Especially get hit in the eye. But I got hit in the eye by a catapult, stung from a catapult. Um, they, I could hear bang, 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 and I'm God. I'm going to be hit. I'm going to be hit. I know I'm going to be high. I know I'm going to be hit. Bang, and I was hit. I knew I was going to be hit. That fear, I'd never felt that fear before. Like, it almost, I, I brought it onto myself. It was, it was hit, and I just fell down. I didn't, I wasn't unconscious. I couldn't believe that I didn't become unconscious. It's almost, I stayed, I stayed. It broke a lot of bones in, in my eye as well. It was just a mess of, um, and that's, that's what happened. But, uh, I mean, that is life. That's what happens. I'm, I love my life. I mean, thank yeah, that's God what that. I'm saying. They, that's what I'm saying. You know, Sometimes it seems like a bad thing happens at the time because I've had things like that, and I, I and at the time about it I a lot, Craig. I thought about yeah. that a lot as as you're saying it, and um, I think you might be right. Yeah. And it, my mum went to things, a faith, my mum went to a yeah. faith healer later because I was going backwards and forwards into hospital having another operation. So after. But after the first 10 months or so, they let the, I had a cataract come on my eye. So basically they, they said, you know, when the cataract, it would take a long time for the cataract to come. So after about 10 months or a year, I went back and they took the cataracts off the eye. Then I went back in and they tried to put a lens inside the eye and this kind of stuff, which they couldn't do. And I was getting terrible headaches. They were giving me CODIS tablets four times a day. Because I I wake up with these terrible headaches, really really I really imagine. bad, really really bad headaches. Yeah, because as it as it's the eye settled down, but it was almost you know it, it was suffering. Yeah, and, you got all uh, that inflammation in there. That's got to yeah, pound on your head on they your were brain. Saying the same thing. They were saying the same thing. They said you know it was congealed stuff and whatever in there. Anyway, um, my mum. I was having these headaches every day, and I became so depressed. And I didn't realize it was depression. It, it was just, I was stuck in this, for eight weeks, I was stuck in, in that hospital. And my mum and dad were coming up every day into London, sitting either side of the bed. And I was saying, you might as well go home. You might as well go home. I've got nothing to say. I'm stuck here, and I've got nothing to say to you, you know. And it was wicked what I was saying to my mum and dad. But I did. And you know, you know, realize it just upsets them more. But they didn't. They were brilliant, you know. And they sure, yeah. Every, well, you love your kids. Every day they would come up for twenty-five minutes. We only had half an hour of visiting. They come for twenty-five minutes, all the way up to London, and then go back on the train, 
and uh, but they would be there. This particular day, I woke up free, free of any pain. It was amazing. From out of the blue, I was free of pain. Yeah. And I thought, all day, I thought, I can't wait to see my mum and dad. And I was pacing the floor, and, you know, it was coming out to 7 o'clock, and my visit in time was 7 to 7.25, basically. And um, they came in, and they looked at me like, oh, how's he going to be today? And I said, I could come out. I feel good. And she said to me, my mum said to me, are you wearing perfume? I was 15, remember. <laughs> are you wearing perfume? I said, no. No. Where am I going to get perfume from? I've got no yeah, money. Yeah, right. And I've been in it for eight weeks, seven weeks at the time, you know. And she said, are you wearing, you're not wearing perfume? She said, no, she could smell this perfume around the bed, spiritual perfume. And she looked at me and she said, I was so, I was so, worried about you i found a faith healer and the guy was very well known where i was he was very well and i didn't even think she would have done that but she phoned this ted fricker now this is a strange story she phoned ted fricker who i'd never met she had never met she just knew he was a famous faith healer he was in the papers he was very very famous he said mrs ballard i can't visit him I've got so much I'm trying to do. I've got queues of people outside my house. Howard Road, Tottenham, he lived. He said, I've got queues of people outside my house, and I can't go and see him. I'll give him absent healing. I won't see him. I'll give him absent healing. So, <laughs> so that's what he did, apparently. <laughs> that day I woke up feeling, I, I woke up feeling I was free. You know, she said, I don't believe it, she said. I, I phoned Ted Fricker. Well, I knew who she meant. I'd never seen him, but I knew it was yeah. Ted Fricker. When she said faith heal, I knew it was going to be Ted Fricker. 18 years later, now 18 years later, you know, this is. So you're like 30 at the time. I was, actually, I was terrible. 18 years later, I, no, I, I was, it was 20, I was 28. Okay. And I just have been on television. I just been on television. I just done a pop quiz on television with Chaz Chaz Hodges from Chaz and Dave. You know Chaz and Dave. No, they're famous in England. Your wife would know them. They're famous in England. They were. Chaz has died now, but we did it together. Errol Brown from Hot Chocolate. Okay. They were all. They were all on my side. Hot Chocolate. You know. They were on my. I had to get a team together to do this on television. <laughs> Against Paul Gambaccini, American. Alvin Stardust and uh, Lindsay DePaul. And, uh, God, what driving... a memory you have, man. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I was driving home. I was driving. I had Chaz with me in the car because we live close to each other. And I said, do you fancy an Italian meal? Because we go past, in Palmer's Green, we go past this Il Faro, which was a place I used to go to. And I was very friendly with the owner. He went, yeah. So we stopped and had a pasta. It was a double-fronted restaurant, quite big. Not many people in there. I go in there, in this side, and suddenly this guy's looking at me. He's my friend, who's about 25 years older than me. And he went, Russ, he's a businessman. He said, Russ, he said, I didn't realize you were in here. I said, yeah, I said, this is Chaz, blah, blah, blah. This is Reg. He's a good friend of mine. And he said, Russ, I've got to go. I'll see you. I've got to go only because I'm with a couple of friends. I said, right. He said, yeah. He's a faith healer, actually. Holy I went, shit. I said, what's his name? He said, his name is Ted Fricker. Holy crap. I said, you, you're kidding. He said, no. It, why? I said, he, he healed me years ago, Reg. He went, you're kidding. I said, no. He said, I'll go and get him. And he brings him in. And he, he looked at me and he went, I said, you healed me years ago. We never met. You gave me absent healing. He said, when was this? I said, God, I was in Moorfields Eye Hospital in uh, London 18 years ago. He said, I said, my mum could smell perfume around the bed. He said, that's clear essence. He said, that, that was my, that's my spiritual smell. It's actually my aftershave, believe it or not. 
I said, well, whatever happened? He said, have you read my book? I said, no. He said, you've got to read my book. I, I, we became friends. He How was about, weird. He was about, he was about 84 then. He was about 84. We, he beca we became really good friends. He, That's he, so he, uh, random. He endorsed me for the Wine Society in England and stuff. And uh, we became really big friends. We had lunch together and uh, we sat together. We had lunch, and there was about six of us, eight of us, having lunch in the same restaurant. And he gave me his book. It was called God is My Witness. And he'd, in this book, Prince Charles got in touch with them. Well, it was now King Charles of England, right? King Charles. Mm -hmm. And Princess Di, right, you know. He said, uh, yeah, oh, it's all in the book, you know. Uh, it was Prince Charles then. He got in touch. His his um, secretary got in touch. He said, I, King, uh, "Prince Charles would like to meet you." He gets very similar feelings to the feelings that you uh, you you suggest in the book. He said and he'd love to meet you because he gets very similar feelings, you know. So he said, "He said, yeah." He said, "He said it was great." He said, "I went to the." He said, "I went to a stag party. We went to the wedding." <laughs> This is him and his wife Grace. They went. It's all you know. Uh, it's it, he healed King Khalid, King Khalid at the time. I think Saudi Arabia or whatever, but whatever. He was in the middle in the Middle East. He all these various people, these people from uh, celebrities from England. He healed them. He healed them all, and um, King Khalid gave him a gold watch. And it's all in the book, you know. And later he said to me, have you, have you, do you know about my latest book, Why why, why, why We Are Put on Earth? I said, no, no I, I don't know that. And he gave me a cassette. It's all in narration. It was never written, but I've got still got the cassette, and it's narrated. Why, That's why crazy. We are put, why, why We Are Put on Earth. So we became great friends. I went to Reggie's mother's 90th birthday, and he was there. And, you know, it was all going on when we got into the restaurant. And I walked up to him. And he, was, he, was sit, he was sitting there. And um, I went, Reg, uh, uh, Ted, how are you? And he held my hand. And he wouldn't let it go, you know. We, he was just held my hand. And I sat down. It was so embarrassed. He was just holding my hand. And I thought we'd had a stroke, you know, just holding my hand for about 20 minutes. Oh and my I was God. sitting there, and he wouldn't. He wasn't speaking to me, and I, and I was speaking to oh, him. Oh, he was just holding your hand while he was yeah. talking to other people. That's weird. No, no, and he couldn't. He couldn't talk. I thought he had a stroke, so I said to Reg. Yeah, after he had died, years later, I said to Reg. He held my hand, Reg, at your mother's ninetieth birthday, and he wouldn't let it go. When he, he said, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "After he'd had a stroke," he said, "Had a stroke." I said, yeah, he said, never had a stroke. He was pissed. <laughs> but he said to me, Ted uh, said to me, he said, you can, he said, you can heal. That's well, interesting. I sat, I sat next to him at this, at this thing. No, it was, it, it was another one. I'm sat with him. I'm sat with him next to him, you know, and he said to me, you can heal. This is a different time. He said, you can heal. And I said, why do you say that? He said, the person you are. He said, you can heal. But that's all he said to me. Uh, we became good friends. And then um, I did play him a song. I'd written a song called The Healer that I did record, actually. And it was written about Ted, but I changed the gender because it, at the time it, it, it wouldn't have been appropriate. You know, he's singing about she, she is the healer, but it should have been he is the healer because standing at the crossroads which one do i walk down one one road goes to your door the other out of town there's a haze in front of me and it's clouding all i see there stands the healer the healer in every road i play she is the dealer he is the dealer when i call her name there stands the healer there's someone that i know and where troubled waters flow he will abide, stem the tide, and lay the waters low. He is the healer. And when I'm scared, I shout, where are you now? 
how much pain will you allow? I sweat, I wait, and then somehow this stands the healer. <laughs> how the hell do you the remember day. all these lyrics from songs that you've written? I mean, it's not like you just wrote 20 songs in your career. <laughs> no, I've written uh, 500. It's just phenomenal. I've got 500 published. Um, yeah, which means you've probably written 2,500 at a minimum. Here's one from Book of Love for you. This is from Book of Love. This is, it gets to the end of the Book of Love, this my album, when it, it's talking about humanity and how we're similar. We're not, we're not separate from each other. This is a true story. As, as we're going through, as we're going through the, through the story, we're getting towards the end, you know. And I'm getting to know different aspects, different aspects of, first of all, I'm on the road. You, you might be able to uh, feel au okay with this. You might feel, yeah, yeah, and understand what it's about, you know. She looked great in hip-hugging silk. That time of the night, the wine, the seductive light. I kissed the mouth. It's then we made love or something like it, or maybe not. I said, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I could still hear her crying from the stairs down below. And as I walked into the night, not feeling good, not feeling right, I said, onto the next valley and hill, the newest fashion, the next cheap thrill. I thought, give me time, I've got plenty still, but time waits in silence and moves in for the kill. So I tried it, chewed it, swallowed it now, always looking at the stars after falling to the ground. I thought, this is it, this is it, this has got to be it. But no, on to the next. I played love and made love and thought, is this it? Is love so cheap, a game, a small affair, or is there something deeper we could share? I found the priest, the monk, the rabbi, so, so secure they know the way. Won't even listen to what the other has to say. Still, I tried it, chewed it. Swallowed it down, always looking at the stars after falling into the crowd. Yeah. This is it, this is it, this has got to be it. No, on to the next. That's one. And then it goes further forward. As it gets too close to the end, I'm sussing things out and whatever, you know, and realizing that love's much, much, much bigger. This is a true story. This is a true story. I met a, I met a girl from China. <laughs> I wonder if I play the guitar. No, I can't play the guitar and do this, actually. You won't hear it anyway. I met a girl from China. She became my friend. When I learned to understand her, there was much to comprehend. I sympathized with the stories. She laughed at my jokes. So many things about that time her memory evokes. I said, just like me, you get angry. Like me, you get mad. Just like me, you're happy, then you're a little sad. We could blow smoke rings from the same cigarette. We could write a song, maybe a little duet. She said, eyes that are shut, they will never see. If you want the fruit, you've got to shake the tree. Everyone in the world's playing blind man's buff. Just like me, you're looking for love. Then I met a man from Africa, Dakar, Seneca Wall. Apart from the color of his skin, he was like a man I knew from Montreal. I said, do you get scared? So do I. Think there's nothing there? So do I. And then he said, Have you ever faked love? Me too. Give not enough? I do. Do you state your case? Well, so do I. Then close your mind to the reply. Have you said there's no God? Then prayed at night. I have. I do. And again, I might. Do you get so angry you can't understand? You do. I do. So does every other man in France or Spain or Timbuktu. What's inside of him is inside of you and inside of me is in every other. Whoever you are, you're my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. Just like me, you get angry. Like me, you get mad. <laughs> I guess wow, towards the end of the album. That one line, time waits in silence and moves in for the kill, that's pretty heavy. That's good, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, it does. It does. But the things that we can't see I mean a lot more than things we can see. Like with water that you, it, you see through water and whatever it's, what they call it, it is. We see through it, basically. Air that we breathe that we breathe in and out consciously, the air that we can't see it. 
atmosphere, we can't see it. What's inside atmosphere that we can't see? What is inside this atmosphere that's keeping us alive? Did you ever figure out the answer to what is love? What is love? Yeah. Do you care to share it? It's the act of extending oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own and or someone else's spiritual growth. That's a great answer. It's, so it's always action. It's not feeling. It's not this, it's not this sex. It's not, no, no, no. So you can love a stranger. You can, while you're acting it out, while you're not, act, it's, it's an action. It's not acting it out. It's an action. So it's, if it's not an action, it doesn't contain love. Not for me, it doesn't contain love. So if, you know, you help someone across the street, you don't even know who he is or she is, but you're mm -hmm. helping them. That's love. But you but care don't you for think someone... it's a feeling too? No. You don't think it's a... F really? No. No, it's a feeling. And that's a chemical thing, I think. Interesting. The thing about, you know, if, if you listen to a lot of Krishnamurti, which I have done in my life, a lot of stuff, you know, it talks about the difference between the brain. And he talks... It talks about mind. It talks about mind and brain. They're two different things. I know it's dualistic, but it's two different things. And David Bowen speaking to him, you know, and David Bowen says, you know, so what's, so what is mind then? He said, well, the mind is a computer. It's a computer, basically a computer. And it works on its own program. And it's always in the past. It's always from the past. He said, so what is the program it's working on? He said, it's thought. Thought is always the past. When you think, you can never live in the, in the now while you're thinking because everything you're bringing into now is from the past. Our language comes from the past. Our memories comes from the past. Everything comes from the past. There's nothing that is... So basically, it is a computer works on its program, which is the past. So when you think you have a thought, it's always from the past. You can't think about the future because it happened. If you can project the now, you can project the past, bring it into the now and project it into the future. But it's not the future. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's an interesting, it is an interesting one. But, you know, when you do something for mind, you've got it. You've got the answer. You've got the answer. But you're not thinking. So thought screws it up. Because you <laughs> thought screws it up. You know, it's like a footballer that plays by instinct. If you think it's a thought, it's a length of time. It's a length of time. So when you think it takes that long, it's that long to think. But when you work for mind, it's, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, and it's there and there. It's immediate, it's immediate, you know, you've got the answer. But don't you think when people come up with, uh, you get somebody like Einstein, they won't. I know Einstein worked on calculations and stuff like that. But when you get the answer, it just happens, doesn't it? You know, this just happen yeah, it happens in, yeah, to everybody. Yeah. It's so it just happened to me you know, yesterday and I don't know how the hell I got the, the answer. answer to it. You get uh. the answer, but it's mind. It, it thought. I mean you can work on thought and you can come up with but it's there's some they are different. Thought and um Yeah. It's interesting. It's, it, it's very interesting. But, um, Russ, I want to ask you one more question. Hmm. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and has that been intentional or just a natural part of aging? I wrote this down, actually. I wrote this down. I thought this was, um, I, I did write this down 15 minutes ago. Uh, I appreciate you putting all that thought into these questions. 
No, I was interested. I wanted to get it right because you can say things and at the end of the day, you think, oh, I wish I'd have said that. Oh, I should have said that. Right, okay, yeah. I've got this stuff down here. Yeah, I put a few things down there. Are you saying what's the biggest change? Yeah, what's the biggest change in your personality over, over the, the last, last ten over yeah. the last ten years? I, I, this is what I wrote down. I'm doing I'm doing more live shows than I've done in the last forty years. So I'm working all the time doing gigs and things. I'm telling you, I'm doing this rock classic thing. After it, I'm doing the casino in Portugal. Then I'm doing a, a festival in uh, Sweden, and uh, and then I'm doing another handle show with a huge orchestra it's just me and a huge orchestra they have a handle uh you know handle the composer the composer yeah yeah it's in Classical. um leipzig i think halle in halle in leipzig uh and they have a festival the whole week it's a little bit like the austin festival in texas they used to have that festival didn't they I think south by southwest yeah yeah south they do. and it's, yeah. But it's south by southwest. all about handle so I'm doing that for one day. Over the last 10 years, I'm doing more live shows than I've done in the last 40 years. I have two new albums recorded. I'm playing classic rock shows this year. I'm writing some great songs, as I said. And I feel really good. Um, you talk about any words of wisdom I've got here. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Well, I've already told you my words of wisdom. When I go by it, I still stick by it. You know, find a passion. I would say to anybody, find a passion and the world would be a better place. People won't go to war when they've got a passion. They won't need to. You know, find a passion. It's a different world. It's a different, you know, it makes sense. This world makes sense when you get up every day and look forward to it. Not when yeah. you don't look forward to it, you know, when you say, oh, I've got to go to work today, do something I don't want to do. This is supposed to be fun. This is a gift. This is a gift. I, was, I so agree with that. I was literally just talking with my wife about this last night, how important it is and how just watching it's, some program about a scientist and I was like, God, this guy was so passionate about this and he just got involved in this. And I thought that was so cool. Well, he, well that's not, it, isn't it. You know, it, that's it. If you listen to people that are, that are passionate about something, I did a thing with Brian May and he was talking, he said, you're into, he said, you're into, uh, you're into the cosmos and stuff like that. You know, You've written songs about it. I said, yeah, I'm into it. You know, not like you are. I mean, he's, he's a doctor. But, I mean, it's so into it, you know, and you see it changes your life when you do something, find something you really love. And I've got here, tell other people how to, oh, yeah, find a passion. For, I've got for politicians, before you tell other people how to live, get your own house in order. Passion will change your life. The world will make sense. Book of Love, 2007, Labor of Love, not yeah, a talk about. Talk about Book of Love, because I know that's important to you. It's a, an album yeah. that you released. Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, hopefully be coming out here. Yeah, I put these things were not planned. You know, these, these things were not planned. They just happened through music. I'm talking about Mandela now. This is, I've got Nelson Mandela. That's when I thought about hope, to, to talk about hope. That wasn't in Book of Love. That was a thing out on its own. But I thought, you've got to talk about these things. They just happened. And through music, suddenly I'm, I'm working with Nelson Mandela. You know, we're sharing the royalties. He's got, he's got a third of the royalties. And basically, we've given. It's now just for just called, for that just for that little thing he did. Just for that thing he did, but it, it's got it's got a um, a foundation. When he I was going to say, yeah, I'm, yeah. He asked I'm if he could have. He asked if he could have a third. Third. Chris wrote a third. I wrote a third. And Nelson Mandela wrote his thing in the middle. You know, so it's now called Mandela's Hope. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And it's out there. I mean, it's had, um, there's a, a Russian guy who's recorded it. Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. Sip Ewos was really good. It got to number one. It got to number one in the classical chart in England. And then he died. 
<laughs> it was put out. It got straight to number one because he went on TV, was singing on TV. Then he died. Right, right. Yeah. He had he had um, meningitis. Young guy, thirty eight years old. Yeah. Well, Russ, I can't um, thank you enough for all your time, man. And you shared some amazingly cool stories, and I, I really appreciate it. It was really enjoyable, not just to talk with you, but to meet you, because like, I swear when I when I I, I used to see your name all the time, and it's so funny how how life works. Well, you I know, and here we are having a conversation. I, yeah, it's great. It's great meeting you. It's great meeting you. But things in my life, I said, through music, all this stuff, you know, I get Mort Schumann phoning me. Right. I idolized Ricky Nelson, you know, when he was young. I had his kids living with me, you know, talking about their dad, you know. You, you, you accept it because you're in music, you know, and you realize. Sure. But they were telling me stuff in, the, in another way, another strange way, you know. They were saying, because when Ricky Nelson was young, a bit like the Osmonds, but bigger, actually bigger than the Osmonds, when he was young, he was in a family, a family series on TV for years. Right, right. right the, it, it was, was Ozzy called, and Harriet. Ozzy and Harriet. Ozzy yeah. and Harriet. They had his That's brother before David, my time, but I remember. His older brother David was in it. So it was a family. It was a family thing, and they sang songs and things. And he became this heartthrob because he was a great-looking kid. And uh, and they were saying, you know, Dad was telling us, Dad was telling us, and they they did a lot of this at um, what was it? What were the studios in LA? Not Universal. What was the studio? The, the TV MGM? studio. No, oh, the TV uh, studios. Yeah, I, I don't know. Burbank. Okay. Yes. Up at Burbank, Elvis was making his. He was making his movies up there, and Ozzy and Harriet were doing their things. You know. And of course, Elvis had grown up watching Ozzy and Harriet. And apparently, El Elvis was saying to everybody, they were saying, next door, they're doing Ozzy and Harriet next door, you know. And he was saying, God, is, is Ricky Nelson there? And they said, yeah, yeah. And he said, I really want to meet him. That's can, so can funny. Can I meet him? This is Elvis saying, can so I meet everybody him? Everybody has these feelings. It's so funny. We're not separate from each other, you know. Yeah. Totally what happens true. to you? What happens to you as you're growing up is happening to everyone else as well, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I met Michael Jackson, and I saw Michael Jackson. I met, you know, I met Noel Cow, and I met all, all these various people you meet or you work with, and uh, and you know, you meet them, you still get this thrill, you get this kind of feeling. You know? And Elvis met him, and he gave him a belt buckle, you know, taking care of business belt buckle. And he right. gave them to everybody that he met, apparently. You know. But he said he was thrilled. He met, and he's got a picture. They had a picture of Elvis and Ricky Nelson together. El Ricky was excited about meeting Elvis and vice versa. It's a strange one, but we're not separate from each other. That's the amazing thing. If you take away all the things that divide us, and it's things we've made up, things that humans have made up, the things have told you that why we're different from him, why we're different from her. If we get back to natural, language is a big problem. Language is a, is a big problem. Just words are a problem. And we need words, but, you know, if you take away, you know, just as human beings, we are the same. We're not separate from each other. Then I we agree with you. We, have, we can have periods of anger. We can have periods of aggression. We can have periods of... You know, one moment we're all crying, the next moment we can be laughing when somebody says something, you know. That's common to everybody. We all Absolutely. laugh when we're, tickled, when we're tickled and whatever. We all laugh. And yet we think we're so different. You know? <laughs> it's mad. I agree with you, man. I totally agree with you. It's very, very... And I'm going to keep writing songs about it because we need to, you know. And Book of Love needs to be out there just because... Yeah, man, get it's, it out here in the States. It's from the heart, you know. It's All the songs are from the If I hadn't have put such a big rock backing behind it, I was thinking about doing it again or taking taking the big rock backing off and putting an acoustic guitar, just like an acoustic guitar, or maybe very, do it very, so you listen to the lyric. It starts off, before you open up the door, do you know what you're looking for? Someone's arms, this is Barimum's Book of Love. Before you open up the door, do you know what you're looking for? Someone's arms to have around you 
or a stage, a battleground where you play out your wildest fantasies? Or is it deeper? You fear the reaper, so you look for something. Call it love and invent the father up above. I want to know, are you a believer? You'll have love, still you'll leave her, because love works in strange ways. If I knew then what I know now, if I could turn back time somehow, but love works in strange ways. We choose one above another. What turns a friend into a lover? Chemistry or attraction? Your body calling out for action? Or is it not that at all? Are you just answering a call? This is not enough. I must know more about what waits behind that door. I want to know, are you a believer? You will have love. Still you'll leave her because love works in strange ways. Love works in strange ways. That's how it starts. That's, That's how awesome, it, man. When you get into the get into the bulk of the, into the journey, that's the first song in the journey. Yeah. The other stuff is being on the psychiatrist's couch and stuff. And this kid, this is me. When I'm on the psych, psychiatrist's couch, I'm dreaming. And in the, this dream, there's a kid, and it's me. And it's a kid when I'm young. And the kid says, people say you're a wise man. Where can I find love? And the wise, wise, wise man says, you must look for a great light known by many names. Where's the great light? Well, that's for you to find out. You might search your whole life and never find it. But you are in the book of love with everyone. And when you open the book, the great light will be shining. And it goes in, before you open up the door, do you know what you're looking for? <laughs> I just don't know how you remember all this stuff. That is just I don't brilliant, know how man. I remember it. It's probably because they mean something to me. Yeah, but do you remember word for word of something yeah, that yeah. you wrote so there many a, years there ago? A, there, yeah. was, there, was a, there was one little um, part I missed out on um, Just Like Me. You know, they said there's no God and prayed at night. I have, I do. And there's another part of that that I missed out. I realized I missed that out. That was, that was a nice part. Oh yeah, yeah. That was another thing. Anyway, <laughs> we got to wrap me. up. Ha you are hang chill. on. One... Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Finish. You, got, you are you chilled. Great. Come? You are chilled, and it's great. You're chill. You're chill. Thanks. Well, You're I've chilled. had to work at it, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> keep, yeah, keep keep practicing the breathing if you possibly can. And this time, I'm going to look year, into it. This next year, yeah. we'll chat and you'll say, "God, it's changed my life, mate." It's changed my I life. I would love to. I may be coming over there next year, so I'll give you a Yeah, well, when you do, look us, up, look us up and we'll, we'll get together. I'll take it for an that Indian. Would, that would be for Angel a curry. White. How British. <laughs> i take it for a curry. Take me for a curry. How British. Can't get more British than well, that, can it? The night before right? last, or was it last <laughs> night? Last night, the night before, I had Mexican last, last night, the night before. Do they, are they have good Mexican there? I would be curious about Whether that. Whether it's good. I love Dennis Mexican. She makes, she makes Mexican. But when she uh, she was making this Mexican, either last night or the night before, I said, Mexican. She said, yeah. I said, oh, I love your Mexican. And uh, it was magic. But um, Indians are our thing over here, really. Yeah, big time. I, every time Italian, I go over I there. I love Italian as well. Yeah. Well, hang on one second, Russ. I'm going to wrap this up. But stay here. We'll chat for a bit once I uh, just wrap this up. And thank you so much for everything, man. It's been a real pleasure and a treat to meet you, and I really enjoyed our time together. Thank it's you. It's lovely. I, I enjoyed it, Craig. Good. I'm really happy about that. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this, please share it on your socials. Appreciate your support. Thanks a ton to Russ Ballard. If you haven't explored any of russ's catalog i would highly encourage you to do so just go look on wikipedia and your mind will be blown how much music he has created for himself and others and uh you know most important as always remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play guitar and have fun until next time peace and love everybody i am out russ thanks for everything hang on one sec